Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, friends. I'm Trevor, and I'm an alcoholic. Thank you. Uh, We're starting this meeting a little bit early. Everybody's waiting around, just waiting for the meeting to start, and there's sufficient of us to keep it going for the extra time anyhow. So why not? And uh, it's good to see you all here this evening. Uh, I'll just read out the preamble of Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organisation or institution. It does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and to help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And uh, as I said before, I'm Trevor and I'm an alcoholic and the only requirement for me to be chairman of this particular meeting is the fact that I am an alcoholic. And... uh, uh, My alcoholism uh, stemmed over a period of 16 years and right from the day that I took my first drink through till some time after I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I ceased to grow in all of the areas that would have made it possible for me to live comfortably with my family, with my wife and four children uh, and with my fellow man. And uh, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous after 16 years of drinking, I was in a state of uh, total despair. I'd looked around everywhere and was unable to find the answer. And uh, it's amazing how we do come to come to this fellowship because it was on Easter, uh, not Easter, on uh, Australia Day in 1977 that I was standing in the pub and I totally resigned myself to the fact that I was going to be a daily drunk for the rest of my life because that was my lot. I couldn't go a day without a drink and if I had one I couldn't stop and was swept out with the bumpers every night, and I had a blackout nearly every day that I drank. And uh, I was standing in the bar of this uh, hotel, the Royal at Randwick, on this particular Monday night, and a fellow came in that was a good drinking mate of mine, and uh, I hadn't seen him for a short time. And I simply said to him, I said, uh, where in the heck have you been? And he said, uh, I've been on the grog. And I said, how in the heck have you managed to do that? And because uh, he'd been away for about three months, and he said I'd been to AA. Well, I arranged with with that fellow then to take me to a meeting the following night, and I haven't had a drink to this night, and that's five years and three months ago. And the only thing that I've done right in all that time is the fact that I keep coming back to the meetings, and uh, really and truly that is the reason why I am here today. In that first five months, uh, it was a, a settling period. I believe most of us go through some sort of settling period whereby we actually get back to a state of some sort of, uh, I wouldn't say sanity, but of some sort of recognition whereby we're in a position to be able to see ourselves as we truly are, and that was my situation. And five and a half months after I'd come to Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, I was reduced to nothing. I thought that AA was the big be all and end all and it was a cure all for all my ills. Uh, communication was my greatest problem when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I couldn't talk with my wife and with my children, couldn't carry on a conversation at all. And uh, two and a half months after I'd come to Alcoholics Anonymous when everything was supposed to be coming right and rosy and all this sort of thing, they got up and left. They couldn't stand me any longer and I couldn't blame them. And uh, Probably a good thing because when uh, when the wife left me, she took the cat and the do- cat and the kids and the cutlery and all that sort of thing, and left me with a bed and the dog and a knife, fork and plate. And uh, I went into a depression, and this depression was to last about two weeks, and uh, it was getting blacker and blacker. And on this particular day in July, uh, the only positive thought that I had in my mind was the fact that I was going to commit suicide. And uh, and I was laying there with a the bed on the bed. The old dog up beside me for a bit of company and pretty, pretty grim sort of a scene. And the thought occurred to me to ask for help. And I simply said, said, God help me. 
and within ten minutes the telephone rang. And somebody rang me on the telephone that day that had never ever rung me before in their life, but it was able to give me the assistance that enabled me to be here today. That was the turning point. They read, you read out in chapter 5, we stood at the turning point. That was my turning point. My attitudes, my life, everything revolved around that particular point of time. Up until that moment, even in the five and a half months that I'd been in Alcoholics Anonymous, I measured everything in terms of, uh, you know, how far was it? It was three schooners and a midi. Uh, you know, how much was it? It was two schooners and something else other. You know, measurement, everything, my thinking was all orientated around grog. Uh, during my drinking, you know, I never drank with people who didn't drink. I never went anywhere with people who didn't drink. And, uh, you know, if I went to a dry party, that was for about five minutes and then I was off. You know, I had other places to go to. And, uh, and so my thinking was orientated that way. From that time of my turning point, I felt a fantastic uh, release from this bondage, uh, bondage of self that I had. And uh, from that moment onwards, I had an open mind. I was able to uh, change my attitudes to such an extent that it enabled me to see the things I couldn't before. When I came to AA, uh, the fellow who brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous showed me where there was two meetings. I was of the opinion, for some reason or other, that I had to be shown where the rest were so that I could go to them. And nobody ever did that. So I went to two meetings a week. And that's how unwell I was. I just didn't have the ability to be able to pick up the literature and find out there's about two or three hundred meetings in Sydney that I could openly go to, you see. But uh, after this point of time, I certainly knew where they were. I found out where they were that day, and uh, I went on a daily basis then for some considerable time. And uh, as time went on, I found it necessary for me uh, to go through the various plateaus that I was going through to change my group, to get involved in big book study groups, to get involved in where the action was, uh, you know, the steps, uh, traditions, the everything that was available, the beginners groups, the whole lot. And uh, as time's gone on, I think I've attained a little bit of sobriety. Uh, I'm not so concerned with all those things today as I am with my primary purpose. My primary purpose, as I understand it today, is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And to that, I'll defend to the, I'll do anything to the bitter end. And, uh, you know, up until a few weeks ago, I used to say to everybody who'd come my way, uh, ring me at any time. But underneath I would say, for God's sake, don't ring at three o'clock in the morning. But something happened in my life where that was totally removed. Uh, a beautiful incident, and I'll relate this and then I'll allow other speakers to speak, otherwise I'll be here all night. Uh, we come in contact with some funny things in our life, and this one I still haven't got over and I probably uh, will retain some part of it for the rest of my life. My place is such now that the wife and family are back. I've got four kids and they've all got four mates and it's nothing to go home. There's 16 people there for dinner. <laughs> all this sort of caper, you know, you don't know who they are or what they are and all this sort of thing. But that's the way it is and we love it and we hope that they love us. And uh, one of the little fellows that was coming around our way was a bloke by the name of Malcolm. And he even said to me one day, he said, uh, you know, I think I'll come around to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous with you. I said, you beauty, you know. And he says, I'll just go home and get dressed and come. And uh, he got home and he phoned up and he says, I think I'll leave it until another day. And I said, well, you know, the meetings are there. I go every day virtually, uh, any time, come along. Malcolm got into trouble with drink. He was picked up by the police, uh, kicking over garbage cans down the main street. Uh, you know, drink is no longer, being drunk uh, without being offensive is no longer an offence for being picked up. He was. He went to the police station and so, and something happened uh, whereby he found it, you know, the story comes back, he hung himself at five o'clock in the morning after having been picked up. If he hadn't had that first drink, he wouldn't have been kicking over the garbage cans. That made me feel the feeling of bereavement and, uh, you know, the sense of loss and the sense came through to me that I hadn't done enough. I just hadn't done enough and I wore that very heavily. And I was at a group meeting, and one of the meetings we run is a discussion meeting, and one of the people uh, had a loss on the weekend, their brother had died, and through various circumstances she opened up with this in the discussion meeting and uh, told us how there was resentments involved and all this sort of thing. But that wasn't the important thing. The important thing was what happened. 
There were people at that meeting who explained to us very lovingly, very gently, what uh, bereavement, death and all these sorts of things were about. And uh, one gentleman turned around, one of the members turned around and said, you know, bereavement is usually associated in nearly every case with a sense of guilt. And it could be the guilt for not having done something or the guilt for, for having for not having done something, but also for having done something. You know, it's pretty hard to escape it if you're close enough to the person. And once that understanding came through, something happened to me. I now know that it doesn't matter if it's half past three in the morning, I'm on my way to that call. And uh, I only hope I'm given the opportunity now. It's giving me that extra little bit of willingness that will enable me to carry out my primary purpose. That is enough for me. Uh, David, would you like to... Start off, please. Good evening, friends. My name is Dave, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. It's nice to be reminded that I have so many sisters and brothers in this fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's nice to be reminded that I can still laugh. And it's even nicer to be reminded that I can still shed tears, as I did last night and hearing of Edna passing away. No, I don't know just what I'm going to say to you. But I know that the power of God, as I understand him, will put the words in my mouth. I had the privilege in 1957 to serve as a, an usher at the public meeting in Sydney Town Hall and I was fortunate enough to be related to a bloke that I heard say these words and they apply very much tonight as they did then. He said if you take nothing else from this meeting tonight take hope that there is a way of arresting the disease of alcoholism one day at a time. In October last year, I attended a manager's meeting in the Westfield Centre at, Bur at uh, Parramatta. And there were about 80 managers from all over in different fields. And the guest speaker on that night was Walter Dickman. And Walter Dickman was the first man to bring the Dale Carnegie courses here to Australia. And then he branched out and he started a course of his own. And he came out, and I'd just like to repeat just what he, he did and said. He came out and introduced himself. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, he said, I want you to carry out an exercise with me. Will you do this? And they all said, yes. He said, it's quite simple, nothing to be alarmed about. He said, I want you... To do an exercise, uh, quite simply, he said, I am going to clap my hands and count to four. And when I count to four, I want you to clap your hands. Will you do that for me? And they all said, yes, sure. And he turned his back. And he came forward in this manner. One, two, three. And he clapped his hands and everyone clapped with him. And he said, is there anyone here that didn't clap their hands? And two mugs put their hand up, one bloke over there and me over here, you know. And he said to the fellow over there, he said, why didn't you clap? And he was a young bloke. And he said, I was too slow. And he said, what about you? And I said, I'm an old age pensioner, I'm slow. But I said, I'm still waiting for you to say four. And these are the most important things that I think I need to do and need to be aware today that they are here for me. Hope, which I've proved over a number of years, will work if I want it to work. And to be able to listen, to be able to listen. And it took me a long time to listen. Because I was a, I was around AA in Sydney for nine years. And I was selling life assurance in a 
ticklish problem came up in Grafton and they said, Dave, we want you to go up there. You'll only be there for three months. All we need to know is you're going to take your family with you, with you or you're going on your own. And I said, I can't tell you. I'll have to talk it over with my wife. And we just had the second young fella. And she said, no. She said, I'd prefer to stick it out here where I have everything that I need than to go up there and peddle my papers in rented quarters. So off Dave went to Grafton. And it was a ticklish situation that involved him from Chatsworth Island to Port Macquarie. You know, nothing to do, anything like 1,800 mile a week. And I was unfortunate. I could not get to a meeting in the towns on the night that they met. I was making contact with people like Joe and, and uh, our committee chairman, Tom Kay, who was at Port Macquarie at the time. And after three or four weeks of this, I started getting edgy. I started to feel within myself that I was ill at ease. And I realised that I need a, needed a meeting. And I referred to the reviver. I picked up the reviver and had a look in the back, and in the back it's got Rita, a contact. And I was so far gone that Rita, being a Sheila, she wouldn't be able to help me. And I looked up Lismore, and Lismore's 80 mile one way and 80 mile the other. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting a cold. And I look at Lismore, and Lismore's got Viv and Babe. Won't ring Babe. Babe, another Sheila, she wouldn't be able to help. I ring Viv. And I says, the meeting on up there tonight? And he says, yes. And I says, are you having any rain? He said, no, nothing you can speak of. So I headed from Grafton out through Whipparee. And at Whipparee, water's coming in the valiant car that I was driving. You know, he didn't let any rain. I get there and his little Morris Miner I learned was, learned was his later was floating down the gutter, you know. <clears throat> and after the meeting was over, I was telling Viv just how I was feeling and what I was thinking. And he said, if you can spare ten minutes, I said, I can spare ten minutes for sure. He said, I'll take you around and introduce you to Babe. Around we go and we go to this back door and he knocks and he says, is it all right to come in? A big gruff voice says, yeah, come on in. So we walk in, here's Babe, six foot five and that broad. And ever since that night, I commenced to listen with an open mind. Now, at most meetings we attend in AA, we are asked to do simple things. And the moment I neglect to do these, I'm in trouble. The simple things we are asked to do is come to a, to a meeting, sit down, be prepared to listen, and look for the similarities, not the differences. Don't reject anything you hear because you may come to believe it to be true. You may come to believe it to be true. <coughs> and I attended my first meeting in August 1946. And this was what I was asked to do. Just that. And I started to. I met Fred and his wife. There were only four people there. And Manley's one of the oldest. It is the oldest meeting in the Sydney metropolitan area. And Fred was a chemist in Manly. And I started to relax, sit down. And as you know, the sixteenth word in the third step is God. And I have a brother doing the ministry. And he'd say, Dave, God will help you if you ask him. And I'd haul off and tell him. Now, if you're here tonight looking for differences, don't go past the first step. Don't go past the first section of the first step. Because there's a difference. 
And I tried to live with it for nine years. There's a difference between admitting to Dave that he's an alcoholic, that he has a problem, and completely accepting it. And I had my first drink. I wonder how many of us can remember our first drink. I wonder how many can remember the, the feeling. What's it doing for me? I can. I was a mummy's boy stuck out in Barra Creek in homesickness, and I'm going to bed with a blanket on the floor, like this. And the bloke says, the bottle's on over there tonight. Dave, come across, he said, and have a drink. He said, you won't have to cry yourself to sleep. I went across. I had half a bottle. I didn't even make the tent. I slept on the mica. And the progression of this disease, it's deadly too. You know, I bought a farm. And I know I bought the farm because it shed the pub fence. I paid for a room 12 months in advance because I knew that some nights I wasn't going to be able to make it. And it was only a quarter of a mile up the road. And I know what it is to be embarrassed by the disease of alcoholism because the main road to Griffith used to go past a 240-acre paddock and I put a crop in. But I'd spent the day at the pub and took three bottles of white heather whiskey onto the tractor with me. And I did the whole of the blooming paddock, put everything away. Eight days later I go down and say, wonder why I only got two rows to strike. And I go back up, and the seed wheat's there, the soup is there. And you know, in a small country town, if you don't know what embarrassment's like, not one car at a time would pull up on that main road, but 20 of them. And they'd all lean there and talk to one another and look at Dave's crop. Did you see Dave's crop? These are the feelings. And I was forced, you know, I used to say if I had plenty of money, I wouldn't drink in this fashion. And I was earning plenty of money. I had the farm and the accountant used to say, gee whiz, mate, you're earning big dough. They're calling it $30,000 a year in 1950. I used to say, if I was married, I wouldn't drink in this fashion. I'd pull my horns in. I wouldn't have to go down the road. I got married, you know, a small country town and two lovely looking school teachers arrived. And the farmers come out of the woodwork. But David made up his mind he was going to marry that girl six months before he even met her. That's the type of alcoholic I was. I was racing well ahead, I can tell you. And I used to say if I was married, I wouldn't drink in this fashion. And I married this girl. And we came back to Sydney, and I didn't drink for six months. And oh, hell, didn't I want to. Oh, gee. And after the six months, I thought, well, you know, a couple won't hurt me. And I started. And in a short space of time, mentally blacked out one night, I attempted to cut my wife's throat with a carving knife. Fortunately for me, a fella came into the little flat at which was a partitioned off two room veranda, back veranda on a house in Haberfield. <clears throat> he prevented it from happening. And when I got to work, leery eyed and shaking the next morning, he said, Do you know what you got up to last night? I said, No, not really. I, I said, The last thing I can remember, I said, was when we went to that wake for the fella at the officer's mess and that officer came up the stairs and I king hit him. He said, yeah, he said, I wondered why you did that. He said, oh, he was an officer with me in the, in the army. He couldn't stand him. That was the last I remember. He said, well, I'll take you a little bit further than that. He said, if I hadn't have been come in with you, he said, you wouldn't be here. You'd be in jail. You'd be up for murder. He said, you attempted to, to cut your wife's throat. And I laughed at him. And he said, well, if you don't believe me, ask your wife. And my wife said when I asked her, she said, it's not a very nice thing to tell you, but it's true. And she asked me what I was going to do about it. And I said, I'll go and have a yarn with us. 
And Oz has never ever told me that I was an alcoholic. He suggested to my mother that I may have a problem if she could get me along to a meeting. I may be able to help. That was how I came to get to the August meeting in 1946 to get my mum off my back. I went into Oz's place. He was living at Burwood. Pardon me. And he said, sit down, mate, have a cup of tea. He said, and we'll go to a meeting where you'll meet men and women who have the same problem as you and I. He said, I've been waiting a while for you to come. My immediate reaction and answer, I've been to one. He said, we'll come to another one. He said, and you'll hear people talk about God. He said, and you'll hear people talk about faith. And he said, all I'm going to say to you, Dave, is this. He said, there's good and bad in you. And he said, and the good far outweighs the bad. And he says, faith, in its simplest form to me, is believing. And I went to that meeting. And I know I got something out of it, and that something was keep coming to meetings. Because they told me if I stuck around, that if I didn't get AA and I stuck around, AA would get me. And if you don't believe it, I'm standing here sober tonight. Because that's exactly what happened. I went to a meeting, drunk every night for three weeks. And Ted M., who was Secretary of Ashfield at the time and later Secretary of our Central Service Office in Sydney, was at the meeting I attended on the January weekend of 1955. And he said, Dave, you're having a battle of yourself, aren't you? I said, yes, Ted, I am. He said, have you read this pamphlet? And he held it up. Who, me? I said, yes, I have. He said, I suggest you read it again. And I only know one verse off Pat, and that's all I need to know. When I get what I want, in the struggle of self, with self, and the world makes me king for a day, go to the mirror and have a look at yourself and see what that man has to say. That night, the miracle happened for Dave because I left that meeting that night and have not needed to drink since. Maybe I wanted to on occasions, but I have not needed to drink. And I have done the simple things that have been asked of me. You know, if we look at that first step, it's in two parts. And it's in two parts for a reason, because we're changing the context. We're changing the context of its meaning. The unmanageability of my life was the reason for my first drink. And the first step for me is a commitment. It's a conscious commitment of conviction. Surrender acceptance and convinced. The third step is one of daily commitment to a God that I have limited understanding of. But a God that I love, a God that I trust, and a God that I know that knows me. And I cannot go through the confession stage of the program and arrive at the 11th step and improve or try to improve my conscious contact with a God as I understand him unless I've committed my life to him that day. You know, this is a daily program for me. I'm capable of living with myself. I'm capable of living with other people. I'm capable of love. I'm capable of being loved. And all the excuses for drinking, Dave finds in three things. Resentment 
that people in situations, self-pity, poor old little Dave, you know, and getting anxious about tomorrow. And these people, God love them. They showed me a way that I can live one day at a time without one drink. And for that, and the God that I understand, in this fellowship I'll be eternally grateful for the rest of my life. Thank you. Sylvia. Hey all. I'm Sylvia and I'm an alcoholic. And I belong to the Port Macquarie group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, today, I was sitting there just thinking, and today has been a very lovely day. And uh, here this afternoon we were talking about the conferences and, you know, spacing them out. And, oh, please God, that they don't alter the, uh, our national uh, conference, uh, conver- uh, convention because we renew so many beautiful acquaintances, people we've known, uh, people that we haven't met yet and we come to meet them and uh, it just leaves a beautiful feeling. As a matter of fact, things that have happened over the last couple of days, I've really had a high and I've had quite a few 24 hours of sobriety. But I'm sober today, as Dave made the reference of today, yes, I'm sober today. Uh, today, I can read the steps. I can concentrate on them. And when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I couldn't do that. I had lost lack of concentration, uh, decency, love, full of resentments, hate, jealousy, and jealous of my sister, uh, but most of all, I hated myself. I don't believe I was born to finish up the type of woman I did finish. Uh, I didn't come from an alcoholic family. I didn't come from a broken home. But I am an alcoholic. I've tried many times since I've been sober to look at my family and nowhere along the line can I trace any alcoholism. But I accept myself for what I am. I'm not the bad person I thought I was. I'm a sick person wanting to recover. And again it comes back to that fact, one day at a time. My alcoholism is improving a little bit each day. And I can face the day. And this morning I said to my husband when he woke up, I'd been laying there for about an hour from five o'clock or just after six. And I was reminiscing on things that have happened this particular day and yesterday. And the joy it gave me. And I was meditating in my own personal communication with God. And I have no hesitation and saying God today, and I had been brought up in a good family as a child, taken to church and Sunday school, belonged to everything in the church, but alcoholism deprived me of all this. And then I got to the stage when my brother was killed, I couldn't understand God taking a little baby. Then when my husband died, that was the absolute climax. There couldn't be a God because why could God do this to good people? And so my alcoholism improved dramatically. I really went down the lane, down the gutter. And I finished in the gutter too. I was picked up out of the gutter in my drinking days. And I finished in all sorts of dives. In streets in the city of Sydney today, I wouldn't even walk down the middle of the day. But I had no fear of those things those days because of my desperate need for alcohol. And those among us that drank in the war years know how hard it was to get grog. And so I would go to any length to get grog. I've done all sorts of things. But I finished up by the time AA found me, I was a complete 
derelict in every facet of the word. And when I got to my first or my third meeting at North Sydney, my first two meetings I don't remember much about because I still drank in between those meetings. But the third meeting at North Sydney on the Monday night, I literally ran because I wondered what these people had. And at that particular time, I had nothing and nobody to get sober for. Absolutely nothing. Anything I'd had of value had been sold or pawned or lost. And so at that third meeting, where I heard it said, I could leave that meeting and I need never drink again. Up till today, that's just how it's happened. These people that told me that, there were only a very few people at that meeting, but those people talked to me after the meeting and they said there'll be times that you might want a drink, but you won't need a drink. Make sure you have phone numbers. Well, I might add, I was living in a dirty little room in, in North Sydney and I didn't even have the price of a phone call half the time, let alone have a phone. And they said, well, if you can't get to a phone, get to a meeting. And this is what I did. And there were times I had to walk from North Sydney across the Harbour Bridge to the Old End meeting. And I did it because I was desperate. I wanted again what these people had to offer. They told me again, I repeat, that I could leave that meeting and need never drink again. And that's today, it's just how it's been. But there were times that I wanted a drink. There were times I thought about a drink. But I didn't pick it up. And in my years of sobriety, I suppose, looking back at my drinking period, I've had so many problems and so many things happen that I would have rushed to the bottle. But I never did. I rushed to my sponsor. Unfortunately, he's not with us today, but he was a fantastic help to me and I could pour my heart out to him. Or I'd get to a meeting or I'd phone somebody, but I never picked up that fatal drink because I don't ever want to go back to the hell that I came out of. And this is what it would do to me. I not only drank, right from the beginning, alcohol gave me a headache. I wasn't sane enough or mature enough to know that if I don't pick a drink up, I wouldn't have become addicted to drugs. I lived for a period of time in New Guinea. I tried desperately there to take my life. I overdosed on more than one occasion. And it's only by the grace of God and Alcoholics Anonymous that I am alive today. I often joke about it, but I'm dead serious. But I've often said, oh, you know, he never had any room upstairs for me. So he still wanted me down here. He wanted to make me suffer a bit more. But I don't suffer today. I don't suffer like I used to. I've had a lot of pain, yes, physical pain. But that doesn't worry me. That makes me know I'm alive. And the answer is here. Nowhere else among the people that have the same disease that I have. And at our meetings years ago, you don't hear it said a great deal now, but it used to be quoted if we were a diabetic, we would have to have insulin for the remainder of our lives. Being an alcoholic, I have to have the type of treatment that helps the alcoholic. And the only type of treatment that there is any sort of relief at all in is associating with other members of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I have made a comment, as a matter of fact, one of my women I sponsored made a comment today and she said, I can remember you saying a few years ago, if you only help one person, you can die happy. And this last two days, three people, three women, I've renewed 
a beautiful friendship with, that just because I was sober, a message was given to me, a seed was planted in me, and from that seed I've been able to make transplants. Whether these transplants eventually die, I don't know. I'm not God. I don't attend, intend to play God. But I just put the transplants there and it's up to them. But it does give one joy to see them still sober. And for me, it has been a fantastic convention. And I'm grateful to each and every one here. I've got a lot of old friends and I've got a lot of new friends. Because it doesn't matter where we go, if we have the disease of alcoholism, strangely enough, we're all accepted. And yet, basically, I'm still the same person I was. The only difference is I'm not drinking. I'm clean. I don't have mental blackouts. But for what it's worth, since I've been sober, I've had quite a few very bad nightmares really bad ones but they don't upset me today but apart from that I'm sober I'm clean not only in body but in mind also and today I love today there's love in my heart that I never knew about Alcoholics Anonymous didn't give me back all the family I lost Out of three children, I have one daughter. And out of five grandchildren, I only have one grandchild. God love her, she's 21 this month, uh, this year. And she's going for a world cruise shortly, or uh, by plane. And she knows I'm an alcoholic. But thank God she's never seen me drunk. And I can talk to her. And so for this one grandchild, Edify. I'm very, very grateful. But most of all, I'm grateful that I'm sober. I'm grateful for the love that's given to me. I can share love with my husband today. And it's not shared with a bottle but like I did with my first husband. And I loved him very dearly. But the grog had to come first. And that man never once told me I was an alcoholic. But many, many, many times he used to be heartbroken. He'd say, oh, Sylvia, I don't know why you drink because you can't drink. And he knew nothing about alcoholism. He knew nothing about the disease. And so God took him. And he took him that I might get sober. It was a pretty hard thing to battle with for six years till I got to AA. But I am sober today. I've made my peace with the God that understands me. I don't profess to understand God, but the God that understands me that always understood me. And again, I believe it was the prayers of my late husband, of my mother-in-law and my mother that Alcoholics Anonymous eventually found me. And I'm grateful to the fact that God spared my mother just long enough for me to get sober and only sober a few days but to be able to go and make my amends to her. And for this I'm grateful. But most of all, I'm grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous and God and to each and every one here. And I hope you all have as lovely a time as I've had. Thank you. Phil. Phil. Hi friends, I'm Bill and uh, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I'm from Queensland. Uh, I belong to the Woodbridge Group in uh, Brisbane currently. And it's nice to be here. Uh, I feel a little bit nervous. Uh, I came here tonight, I I got a ticket in my pocket to go to a dance, you know, and I thought there's some, I couldn't think of a nicer place to be on a Saturday night than at a meeting. it's, and, and I might get my dance later. But, uh, however, uh, I'll get my thoughts together in a minute. I, uh, um, I had 17 years of drinking. I'm not, I'm not going to go into a drink of water or anything. I started it, uh, 
a 13 on the banks of the Bogan River in New South Wales. Uh, a couple of fellas had a bottle of Plonk there and they asked me what I like a drink and, uh, and it was the only social drink I ever remember having. And uh, it made me feel the way I thought I wanted to feel and uh, it uh, helped me to be the person I thought I wanted to be. And uh, at 20 I, uh, I'd, uh, I'd been drinking with a school of fellas in North Queensland for a long time and they all died. But one, and he's, uh, he's in charter stowers, and I'm here. And they bought my sobriety for me over a long period of time. I approached Alcoholics Anonymous at 20. I'll be 39 this year. I, uh, I've worked talking about it this afternoon. I've spent nearly half my life around Alcoholics Anonymous. So hasn't always been in Alcoholics Anonymous, so unfortunately. And I came to AA. Uh, I was coming off a bender, and, and I was sitting in a pub in Brisbane uh, on my own. And I saw a young man and a young woman about my age walk past this hotel and they were hand in hand and they were laughing and enjoying life. And I wondered why I couldn't live the way they were living. And I went to Alcoholics Anonymous uh, on my own and the lady at the uh, central office in Brisbane, her name was Phyllis, then it was a long time ago, and she gave me a who me and she said, uh, take this and read it and if you think you have a problem there's a meeting in the next room tonight. And I went back to the pub and I read this Who Me and it had this uh, little questionnaire in there, you know, and I thought I was a pretty smart guy in those days and uh, I loved questionnaires, you know, anything to prove I was smarter than anybody else. And, uh, and, and, and I was here, you know, I had 15 positive answers for 20 questions uh, and I got the other five up later. But uh, <laughs> so, so anyway, I went, to, I went to the meeting that night, you know, in, in, uh, it was in Venus Chambers in, in Wickham Street in the Valley in Brisbane and, uh, and I went into this meeting and there were about 15 people there and they, they were happy and uh, I, as soon as I walked in the door uh, I could feel the affinity with these people, you know, I, I, I could physically feel something and I spoke with them and, 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 and I, I felt that they understood the way I felt and the way I thought. Uh, prior to this I thought I was the only fellow walking around on this planet like me a and they told me that night that I could leave the room that night and I need never drink again you know and I was horrified uh, and uh, but it applies to me as much tonight as it ever has you know I can I can leave here tonight and I need never drink again if I so desire and I, and I know this I know this for a fact uh, and I had a look at the program, they told me I had a threefold disease which was spiritual and mental and physical. And I was also a pretty emotional sort of a fellow too, you know. And I could understand the physical uh, suffering of an alcoholic and the physical craving and, and that. Uh, I didn't believe that I had any mental deficiencies. Uh, I couldn't understand that at all because uh, the way I was at that time, I'd been that way all my life. I had never lived any other type of a life than, than what I was living at that time when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I didn't understand that I was different, uh, in, in, or that I should be living and thinking differently to what I was. So I didn't think that I had anything mentally wrong with me. And, and, and spiritually I was totally bankrupt. I, I realize now, you know, I was uh, verging on atheism. Uh, I went to a Catholic school like many of us did when I was a little boy and uh, and I, I had the nuns, one nun would be telling me about how Jesus loved me very much and and then I'd go into the next classroom and the nun there would be telling me if I didn't toe the line like I was going for the big cook, you know, and, and, and typical alcoholic fashion, you know, I resigned from something I didn't understand when I was eight years of age, you know, and, 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 uh, and through my teen years, you know, I had been in a lot of trouble and, and I'd, I'd asked this God for help, but he didn't come across with this side of the bargain, you know. And so I said, well, there mustn't be any God. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been known to stand in front of Catholic churches and abuse God for the impertinence of putting me on this earth many times, you know. And anyway, I came to the meetings and I loved the people in AA and, and the fellowship, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to do these steps, you know. Uh, I said, all right, I'm an alcoholic. I admitted I was an alcoholic, uh, but I couldn't accept it. And that's as far as I ever looked at the program. And I stayed sober for about six weeks and then I went back to the bush and, and, uh, I remember a little friend, many of us know him here, 
uh, sport sent me my first big book when I was in the bush and, and I read it there and uh, but I still couldn't I still couldn't accept that uh, uh, that I had to stop drinking but I kept coming back to AA you know and, and over a period of 10 years I came to AA and I went away and I still wanted what these people had and and I started to do most of the yes that I heard about around AA and uh, and life got pretty dreadful. The last three years of my drinking was uh, nothing but hell. I, I became a, a very uh, mad person in the community. I believed then and I still believe now that the last three years of my drinking I should have been put away for the benefit of the community. Uh, I was a dangerous man walking the streets. I, I remember trying homicide 11 times and fortunately I failed. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, I, I used to be able to justify in my own mind that I was doing the right thing. Uh, and people wouldn't leave me. I just wanted to be left alone and they wouldn't leave me alone. And they wouldn't, they tried to take away from me the rights to live the way I believe I wanted to live. And finally, how I stopped drinking. Uh, I got married towards the end of my drinking. I, I don't know why I got married, but I did. You know, we, we make some of these mistakes. Some of us had, had, uh, and I was married four months, you know, and my bride of four months came to me one morning. I don't know where she used to sleep, but she wouldn't stay in the same house as me. And, and uh, But she she came home one morning and she had this piece of paper and, and it had been signed by a couple of doctors, you know, and she said, you're totally insane and, and you have to be put away. And, and she said, I'm going to have you committed to, to Wollstone Park. And I said, now wait a minute, you know, like we have to look at this sort of thing, you know. And, and I said, what if I, well, she didn't know that I'd ever been there, Alcoholics Anonymous. She didn't know that I, I knew there was an answer, you know. And, and, and I said, well, I'll, I'll go over up the hospital and see if I can get off it, you know. And, and I went up this PAV4 and, and they wouldn't have me at PAV4 in Brisbane. So then they referred me to Lawson House and, and Lawson House, they didn't want me either, you know. They said, you can go into Wakehall if you like. We've got a beautiful program for people like you up in Wakehall. And, and I said, that would be great anywhere. I wanted to get away from my wife, you know, and I wanted to beat this committal order because I knew that if I'd been committed, they would have certified me. And I knew that they'd fill me up with drugs, and I knew that I'd probably never, ever get out of the place. And so I went into Wakehall, and, and, and in Wakehall, they put me in the slammer there, you know, one of those little rooms with the with the window in the door and and I was in there for five days and when I came out of there I, did, I remember all I remember of it now was there was this fella singing on the wings of a snow white dove for background music you know if I ever get him I'll kill him but <laughs> anyway uh, and then I came out of there and, and I said to the fella, I said, what did you just give me and he said well we didn't give you very much at all he's with some dilantin and that for so he wouldn't take any more seizures. And and I said, how long have I been in here? And he said, five days. You know, and and how I'm alive, I don't know. Uh, but there was the first miracle in my life. You know, here I was. I was free from alcohol. I was I was alive. I didn't believe it was possible to live without alcohol, and I was free of it. And I wandered around in that place for about three weeks, uh, in a bit of a daze. And I remembered a lovely old lady who had been an Alcoholics Anonymous years before when I first came in Brisbane, and her name was Josie. And Josie did the first step in this same place. And Josie used to say at meetings that all you're asked to do in Alcoholics Anonymous is to try. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll go out of here and I'll go back to AA. There isn't anywhere else left. And I'll try just, just one more time. And I wanted to be sober, and the only reason I wanted to be sober because I didn't want to go around hurting anybody anymore. I didn't want to see those tears in my wife's eyes anymore, you know, or anyone else's eyes for that day, you know. And I thought, well, if that's all I get out of life, just to be sober and, and not hurt anybody else, well, that'll be enough. And I came out of there and I, I went back to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had a look at the steps again, you know, and and I accepted that I was an alcoholic, and I didn't do any more about it. I had a look through the program, you know, and I got to step three, and I said, well, one day, if I ever find 
some sort of a higher power that I can understand, I'll hand my life over to it. And that was the decision I made and I left it right there. And I went to a lot of meetings in five and a half years and I sat in the back row with a closed mind and I was unwilling to listen to anybody. I was unwilling to learn anything. I would not communicate with people. I didn't want a sponsor. I didn't believe I needed one. And I got worse. Uh, uh, alcoholism is progressive if we don't do anything about ourselves. You know, it was in me. Uh, and I tried to manage my own life for five and a half years. The only thing I didn't do was pick up a drink. If you ask me today how I stayed sober, I've got to say I don't know, because I don't know. But in that five and a half years, a lot of things happened to me. You know, the wife went and the house went and the car went and everything else went materially. Uh, I had no friends. Uh, I started on geographicals all over Queensland just to try and retain my sanity. And I finally finished in a little town called Gladstone. And if anybody here hasn't been to Gladstone, don't go. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's really bad news there, you know. And, uh, you know, if you want to go into a depression, just drive into Gladstone. You know. But however, uh, I, I was living there in this little flat, and and uh, and I was, you know, I was at the end, I was at the end of my road mentally, and uh, and about this time, somebody came along and he gave me a tape, and it was a tape of an American gentleman who came out here in 1978. His name was Wesley Parrish, and he said, "You yeah, listen to this tape of this American bloke. He, he's got some good news here." And I, I, I didn't like Americans, you know. And I reckon they're all full of wind. Uh, and anyway, I said, well, give us the, I'll take it home. And I only took it home to keep this fella happy. That's all. We'll shut him up, see. And, and one night I put this tape on by mistake. Uh, you know, and, 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 and this fella, he was talking about Bill Wilson on the tape at the particular part I put on and, and how when Bill Wilson was in hospital and Ebby came to see him and Ebby told him to pray as an experiment. And he, and he said, if there's a God up there, show yourself to me. And, and it worked for Bill Wilson, you know. And a few days after this, uh, it must, it must have stuck in my head because a few days after this, I was sitting at the table in that same flat with a rifle and a big book and a bottle of methylated spirits and the power of choice. And I was going to shoot myself. And I, I was fair dinkum, you know, and I thought about this shooting myself and, and I, and I remember a mess that I cleaned up in Sydney in Victoria Street some years before where an alky had uh, done the wrong thing and I hadn't forgotten the smell of the blood and I thought I don't want to leave a mess like this for somebody to clean up and I thought of the little girl that I had, a daughter, she's a very beautiful little girl and I thought it's a terrible shame that it would be for her and, and so I didn't shoot myself and, and, and then I had a look at this bottle of methylated spirits, you know and I didn't, I didn't even then remember the physical suffering so much of alcoholism, but, you know, I remember the loneliness and the remorse and the indignity and the fear. And I haven't still forgotten them either. And the shame for the things I did when I drank and the guilt. And, and I didn't want to go back to that. I didn't want to go back to that life where I drank to escape from the life I created with drink. And so it wasn't very hard to push the bottle of methylated spirits away either. And I had, all I had left was the big book, you know, and, and I opened this big book at random and it came to a page in chapter five where there are three very pertinent ideas. It says, A, that we are alcoholic and cannot manage our own life. And B, that no human power can relieve our alcoholism. And C, that God could and would if he was sought, you know. And like Bill W, I decided to experiment. And, and I prayed, I got on my knees and I said, if there's a God up there, just show me one day of this happiness that I've heard all these people in Alcoholics Anonymous talking about to prove to me that there is such a thing and to prove to me even that you, of your existence, you know. And, and I got one day, that's all I asked for and that's all I got, you know. And that's the way it works for me. And the next day I asked again, you know. And I asked again the next day and I got another day. And the next day I got another day because I asked for it, you know. And this oh, this went on for two weeks. And I thought, you know, I started to read this book. And I read in the back about the spiritual experiences, you know, the, in, in the back of the big book, in the appendices. And I read about 
honesty and open-mindedness and willingness and that if we practice a blatant denial, you know, we get nowhere. And I'd been doing this for years, you know. I had to surrender totally the first step and, and, and you know, I had a hand over. And, and at that night was the first time I'd ever asked for anything on a daily basis in my life. You know, I, I could never understand this 24-hour program that people talk about. I just couldn't comprehend it at all, you know. Anyway, after a couple of weeks after this happened, you know, I decided that, that I didn't know how to live. And I had to find someone who would teach me. So I tried again. I had a yarn of this fella that had become my newfound friend, you know. I said, just show me somebody who can teach me how to live with a little bit of dignity and self-respect, you know. And, and I went to bed and the next morning I woke up and I could remember a man that I'd known in Alcoholics Anonymous in Sydney years before. And he was in my mind. I hadn't seen him for years. And but I cleared him out of my mind and I thought, well, that's, that must be the man that I've got to go and talk to. So, so I snatched my job that day and packed the bags and I off. And the last time I heard of this fellow, he was on the Gold Coast. And I went there, but he wasn't there. But I waited and he came about five months later. And I spoke to him. And he shows me how to live my life still. Today, you know, he was the right person. You know. Great things have happened to me in this fellowship, you know. I uh, I don't have the material things back and I don't particularly care. I don't have the wife back. Uh, I have the daughter back. You know, that's very nice. All she knows about me is my daddy doesn't drink beer. You know, and I haven't had a drink in her lifetime, you know. Uh, I found out some things recently about the way I have to live in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, for the first five and a half years, I came to a lot of meetings and I didn't do the steps and I went backwards. In the last eight months, I've been up in, in the country in Queensland just about loaning it and I've been doing all I can about the program, but I haven't been getting many meetings, you know, and I started to go backwards again. And that's why I came here this weekend. Uh, I knew I had to come here. I snatched the job again to get here. And I don't care, you know, I'm willing to go to any lengths to remain sober and to retain what I have got from Alcoholics Anonymous and to make as much progress as I can. I've had a taste of this freedom and I want more of it. And, you know, I've already got most of what I came here for. I listened here in this room yesterday morning to Archie McKinnon speaking, you know, and he taught me all about gratitude again. And then last night I heard a woman speak over in the other hall there and she taught me about courage. You know, tomorrow morning I'm going to the spiritual concept meeting and I know I'll learn about my friend there, you know. But I'm very thankful to Alcoholics Anonymous uh, for the life that it's showing me how to lead, you know. I, I don't have much anxiety in my life today. I do have troubles, but I can manage them, you know. Uh, I live very comfortably. Uh, I think it's Steve from Gordon or something says that I live with great abundance, you know, and I do sometimes, you know, I have a pretty good car and money in my pocket, but it doesn't really matter to me, you know, but uh, I live real well. Uh, and I, I do what I can about this program. I keep myself available where I can to help people. Uh, but anyway, I'm just so happy to be here tonight, you know. And uh, I still reckon it's much better than the dance. Thanks very much. Jane. Jane, do we hear from you? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jane. I'm an alcoholic and a member of the Stanmore group in Sydney. Hi, Jane. And I feel really nervous. Um, well, I've been in, in Alcoholics Anonymous for um, about... Well, I've been... It's been six months since I had my last drink or drug, and um, before that I I um, drank and used other drugs for eight years, and I could never do any of it successfully. You know, my life was unmanageable, and um, it had been unmanageable before I ever ever drank, and um, I never knew any other way to. You know, I'd always felt the way I I did and still do sometimes today, you know, I didn't know that it, there was any different way to feel. And um, I sort of, I had a fairly normal upbringing, but I always felt different, I always felt like a um, 
square peg in a round hole and I didn't know why and uh, I didn't know there was anything I could do about it. And then when I drank, it sort of, um, you know, it filled the void and it made me comfortable and that's what I chased for the rest of the time I was after the effect and um, I got it for a long time, you know, I, I guess in the beginning. I don't know, I guess there must have been some good times but for the last, you know, five years it was really misery and um, confusion so I don't remember much that I had a very good time at all and um, it just went down you know it never really improved for me I just sort of ran around and moved from place to place and I could never get my life together I was always um, saying oh, oh you know I have to get it together I have to sort myself out but I could just never do it and I couldn't understand why and um you know, I, I sort of had a lot of theories about what was wrong with me, but uh, I never did anything about it. And um, I guess I just had to run my course and get sort of sick enough. And, um, you know, last year that, that happened, I tried other ways. I, I tried to, um, you know, I tried psychiatry and that sort of didn't work for me. And um, I'd really come to my point, I guess, and, and AA found me. I didn't find AA, and I didn't sort of come to AA because I thought I had a, a drinking problem or a drugging problem, and I didn't think I was, you know, I didn't think I was an alcoholic. I didn't understand anything about this disease at all. I was brought here, and um, I'm really grateful that I was because it might have taken quite a few more years, you know, for me to sort of find out. And once I got here, I identified. Um, you know, I wanted to go to Al-Anon first because I figured I was an Al-Anon uh, candidate. And uh, once I sat in an AA meeting, I knew I was that's where I belonged. And uh, so I continued. And uh, once I stopped drinking, of course, I knew I was an alcoholic and because uh, that's all I could think about. And, uh, and so it sort of began. And since then, you know, I, I guess it's been... Uh, sort of really, you know, up and down, <laughs> it's sort of, uh, I have a lot to learn, you know, I, I sort of, it's only starting to, I guess the fog's only just starting to lift, I didn't realise how confused I was, I really came in very proud and thought I knew it all, and uh, I'm only just finding out now that I don't know anything much at all, and uh, that I have to listen, and that was something I found really difficult to do, was to listen, and um I mean, you know, it's wonderful to be here at the convention. I find this difficult sometimes too. Such a big thing with lots of people, but at least I can handle it, you know, whereas before I just wouldn't even attempt to handle it. I just sat in my house and uh, and just isolated myself for years, and at least now I'm sort of willing to have a go. I fail often, but um, that's okay. And, um, you know, at least today I know what I am. I'm an alcoholic and I know what I have to do if I want to get better and get well and uh, live, you know, a, a life that I want. Um, and that's certainly a big relief because I always wanted to know what was wrong with me and I just, you know, I didn't know where to look for the answers. And now I know. And um, I don't think I can say any more. I'm just grateful to be here and thanks very much. Ernest. Ernest. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Ernest, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, this is my first convention, and uh, a little bit overawed by the whole thing. I'm only some 13 months into the program, and uh, so much happened so fast. Uh, a little over a year ago, I was just out of um, Langton Clinic, and I had had a bust and I'd been coming to AA approximately six months prior to that. And I walked through the door of um, the group that I belonged to on, on the Saturday morning to a beginner's meeting and uh, my ex-sponsor who was waiting for me to reappear, apparently he knew I would, he looked at me and said, uh, have you taken the first step yet? And uh, I was just talking to this to Trevor before the meeting, and uh, it appears that he knew a lot more about me than I knew about myself. 
And I was rather affronted by this. And, gee, at least he could have done was to pat me on the back and say, what a good boy you are to get back. Uh, but getting back was the important thing. And from that time forward, uh, the realisation came to me that um, I couldn't sort of sit on the fence with AA. I couldn't have a bit of both worlds. I tried the drinking thing again, and uh, I didn't. I certainly didn't want that anymore, so I had to make a commitment to AA and to myself if I wished to survive. Uh, because during the, that brief period of drinking that I did indulge in, um, thoughts of um, so thoughts of suicide, which I hadn't had before, and the only reason I didn't was because I was in a, I was up in the first floor of a building uh, for some time and I didn't want to jump because I thought I might hurt myself. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Coward right to the last. So, you know, when, when, when I got in I realised that then I had to take the, the program seriously and with that in mind I, I did everything my sponsor suggested I should do to the best of my ability and it's been a very rewarding year. Uh, within the space of this year I've done what I could in, in the way of basic service to the group I belong to and I didn't like doing that either I didn't like it at all but I knew it had to be done and already I, I've been a secretary in a minor way for six months so I've uh, led, a, led a beginners meeting for, for the last three months and uh, my group has people come from Langton Clinic on a Saturday morning um, and I, I was able to see within these last three months what I was like a year ago. Um, people were asking the same questions, asking of me the same questions that I'd asked of other people about a year previously. And I, I was able to see already the, the small amount of growth that, that, that I've, I've been able to achieve with the help of my group, my sponsor, and him up there and that took a little bit of um, coming to uh, terms with too. I, I led a, a religious life as, as a child that I didn't want, to, didn't want to lead because my parents were very religious people and they preached a, a God of fear and uh, it wasn't a God of love at all and I got away from that as soon as I was old enough to get out into the world and I guess with a large chip on my shoulder because I didn't understand what, what a God of love was all about at all. And it, take, it took me some little time and I had to accept the fact that, that there was a God and that too was, was a very um, hard thing for me to do after having lived for about 25, 26 years as, as the God of my own little microcosm and not a very successful one either, I, I wouldn't say. Because when I when I first got to the fellowship, I had three dollars that I that I'd managed to bum off the bloke that uh, twelve stepped me. And that was all I had, and not 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 a great deal for forty three years effort in, in life. I I didn't think at the time, because I was still thinking on material terms only. Now I, I I've got so much more, not very much more materially. I do have a job, and I've just recently had a had a holiday. It's the first holiday that I've earned for 12 months' work in about eight years, I think. And that's only due, due to AA. Uh, little things, friends, people I can ring up on the telephone, people who, who call people who call me. Uh, what family I have uh, is AA, and I'm possibly not a very good son of that family, but I'm very proud to be one. Thanks, Trevor. Just a word of explanation, we did start this meeting early, so if anybody feels that they need to get up and move out or even go off to some other venue, please don't be embarrassed, uh, we quite understand. Uh, the meeting's likely to go on for some time, I've no need to uh, finish it off when the time comes, so, uh, you know, it might be necessary for some of you to move out. Pat, could we hear from you, please? Good evening, friends. My name's Pat and I'm an alcoholic. Thanks. Ah, oh dear, I'm a bit nervous too. I didn't expect to be called. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to this fellowship and all you people 
for this wonderful life that I've found in AA today, you know, through this program and new people. But it has given me my life back. And um, my womanhood, my self-respect and my dignity, I have those things back today. I didn't have those things. I lost them all through my alcoholism. And um, today I'm living the life that I always wanted to live and didn't think I'd be able to ever live, that there would be nothing left for me, just drinking myself into the uh, either an early grave or the um, rat house. I had 27 years of drinking. I picked up my first drink at 18. I was brought up in a home from the age of five because of my mother's alcoholism. And I grew up very bitter and resentful when I was old enough to know that I was in this home and had a mother out there whom I thought didn't want me. Today I understand her, who she is. Well, she's not here today. She died an alcoholic, but not drunk at the time, about four years ago. And uh, I never ever forgave her all that time because of uh, that unhappy childhood I had in those homes. And um, she was an alcoholic, as I said, and uh, I drank with her right through until she died, before she went to hospital. And uh, I think myself very lucky to have been given this chance in life, this new... Uh, this uh, new lifestyle, entirely different lifestyle to what I was used to living. And I uh, I do think myself very lucky that I was able to, uh, that I was given this chance and my mother never got it. As I said, I drank for 27 years. I drank a lot. I drank the methylated spirits and the methyl and the wine mixed together. When I couldn't get a drink, that's what it, when I did turn to methyl, I... Uh, thought it was degrading anybody who ever drank methyl earlier on that I'd never drink it and I was to drink it. Um, well, I suffered that when I picked my first drink up at 18, I can remember I suffered right through until I came into AA. I've been uh, two years and eight months in AA now and I suffered these blackouts the change of personality, and uh, loneliness and the emptiness I always felt. And uh, that first drink I had, it, uh, it filled that emptiness up and it helped me commu to communicate. I was a loner and I could get out and I could mix with the rest of them and do the things what I wanted to do, get out and dance and all the rest of it. But then I was my old self after I'd, uh, the drink had wore off. Anyhow, I got married, and that marriage never lasted. This fellow said to me, any woman that drank like, drinks like you did, he, I didn't let him see the way I drank before I married him, but I really let myself go after I married. That marriage didn't last. It lasted four years and a few kiddies. And he left. In that time, there's been... Uh, few de facto, that was 23 years ago, and there'd been a few de facto relationships. They were all alcoholics. And um, as I say, I, couldn't, I didn't know how to be a normal wife, how to be a normal loving mother to my children. And I still get this shot back into my face uh, today from the adult uh, family that I have because I'm in AA. And I've had to detach from them in a loving way, the best I could. That was about six months ago. I couldn't see why I heard them telling me in AA all the time. I did pick up a drink after 20 months in AA. And it was through uh, one of the reasons. It was these three uh, three children having goes at me and <coughs> wearing me down. And uh, I got depressed and I picked up a drink. Telling me not to come to AA, I had to come back and get the family together. Anyhow, I won't go into a drunken log. I came into AA. Uh, at the end of 79, 
The fellow I was living with, we were drinking all through the Christmas, and I was trying to cook Christmas dinner on um, New Year's Eve day, and we were drunk, and it was always like that, you know, I could never, I was always drunk the week before Christmas, always through drink Christmas, and it'd be after uh, New Year, around about New Year, I could cook that Christmas dinner, that's how it was. I got my first Christmas dinner in 80, 1980, because I was sober that year. And uh, so my kids, I'd had the Christmas fair there in, in the house already and the fridge filled up, but it was never ever cooked. So anyhow, an argument, uh, we were arguing down each other's throats all that day. And uh, he came at me while I was doing the vegetables. He didn't want me to cook this Christmas dinner. Um, he was jealous about the other boarder being in the house and that I was cooking a Christmas dinner for him. And if he'd have told me that earlier on, I'd have thrown all the vegetables to the backyard and put the turkey back in the fridge and let it go. But I didn't know what, what he was carrying on about. So anyhow, I picked up the carving knife and I stabbed him in the lungs during that uh, bit of a fight at the table. And he was taken to hospital and he was 15 minutes off death by the court... Uh, hearing when uh, the ambulance and uh, paramedics were called in. He was 15 minutes off death and he was very fortunate to have uh, been able to get to a couple of meetings while he was a patient at the uh, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney and he was able to get to a couple of those meetings and he came out three weeks later to get his clothes to go to a halfway house and he told me he was in AA and he didn't want a drink because I offered him a drink. And uh, I said, what's AA about? And he said, you wouldn't understand. <laughs> so uh, he used to come down and have tea every night, come down and have tea every night time and pay me for his tea and ask could he have half an hour's rest to go to these AA meetings. And he still wouldn't, I, he still wouldn't tell me what they were about. So I snook in while I was asleep and looked through his pockets and I found that just for today card. And I saw the God part mentioned on it and when he woke up and came out to have his tea after when he was leaving, I, ta I said, ha, huh, I know what it's about. I said, you'll end up holier than thou. <laughs> you and your God. I always believed in God, but, uh, I always called myself a child of the damned. Not re I reckon that he didn't give me a fair go in life, that I was put, in a, put into a home at the age of five without a mother and father's love and we were ill-treated in that second home from the age of ten till I left. And I didn't have much time for God and my mother. So anyhow, I saw that Just For Today card and I saw God and uh, I thought it was a religious turnout and I didn't want any part of it, but I thought it was good for him. He wasn't drinking. And uh, I didn't want it, but I certainly needed it, but not knowing it. Um, three months went by and I saw him up the street and he was still still hadn't had a drink all that time. Six months went by. In this time, he would never ever come back near the house after the first week because we were always wrangling down each other's throats. And he came back six months later with a doll's house that he'd made for our baby. And... Uh, I said to him that night, I'd like to go to one of your AA meetings. And he said, don't have a drink tomorrow night and call up the halfway house and come with myself and the boys. Well, at that time, I was a bit frightened because drink had deserted me. All the uh, glamour had gone out of it and I'd, I was a bender drinker. And uh, it wouldn't do nothing for me. And I was left a bit scared and frightened wondering what had happened, because I just drank to knock myself out, woke up, back into it, and drank on to knock myself out and didn't want to see anything or know anything. And uh, I went to that first meeting at uh, Stanmore on the 18th of June, 79, with him. And as Bill said, I uh, felt home and hose that first night I walked into that meeting. That affinity, that physical affinity, I felt that, you know, and I knew there was something here for me and the search was over. 
because I knew that he'd kept sober for six months and uh, I thought if he could do it, I can do it. I kept on coming to meetings every night. I loved the meetings because I loved the friendship. And I didn't know much what they were talking about because my mind was very scattered. My three older children at the time I came into AA were confer conferring between themselves to put me in uh, one of the uh, psychiatric centres. I couldn't see that I was going mad but uh, I know a lot about it today. I was very scattered and uh, of course I thought the, uh, I knew there was something wrong with me and I thought to be mad uh, like one person in Newtown hops up and down the street on one leg and I thought that's insanity and then there's another woman, she walks up and down the street, crosses over and up and down that street all day. Well I thought that's insanity, I'm not mad, I'm not doing those sort of things yet. <laughs> but I was on the brink of uh, going a little bit mad and uh, my memory was uh, going on me and uh, I couldn't remember nothing, uh, even sober, which I wasn't very much, there was never the times I was sober, it was just on a bender and back off to get a little bit physically well, a bit of soup into me and back onto it again. So anyhow, I kept on coming to meetings, so I stopped sober for 20 months and I was to pick up a drink again. And I was very angry about uh, having to drink again and uh, I didn't know why I drank. So I thought I, I was working these steps to the best of my ability. So I had to go and have a look at these steps and see and at myself. And I had a look through the steps again and uh, the first one, I'd admitted I was powerless, I knew I was the alcoholic, but I hadn't accepted that. Uh, so today I fully accepted that I am this person, the alcoholic, and I cannot pick up that first drink. Um, step two, I, I believe that. Uh, step three was um, I'd handed my life and my will over, but I didn't understand this part where I was taking my will back. So today I made the full surrender. I've thrown in the towel and the hat and the boots and the gloves, the stockings, the whole lot. Um, uh, four, I had to go back there in four and look at myself. Well, I picked up, I uh, was on the dope six years. My daughter got me on to smoke a marijuana so I wouldn't drink. So she go, ended up giving me a, dub, a double problem. Because I, ha I had to go back to the drink, I couldn't stop just on, t on the uh, dope, it wasn't uh, strong enough for me. And I wanted the drink, so I was mixing the both of them and she was supplying it. Um, so I had a look and I had picked up a smoke and I was smoking again. She said, this doesn't make you mad and you are serene and you're not stabbing people and <coughs> half killing all these husbands that you had every time you got drunk of which did happen, every one of them's nearly been dead. And I've nearly been dead too, and in hospital and nearly lost my life. And uh, so I, there was the smoking, and I had this practicing alcoholic uh, living in my house, and uh, I was playing God to him, holding his head up above water, and uh, he, he helped pull me down, and uh, I drank again after I'd seeing that, you know, he was pulling me down. I had to drive around and look for another flat for him and got him away after 18 months when I was a wreck back down to... and then I picked up a drink after I got him out. Um, then I had a little girl who was a result of my drinking and she's classed as a, assessed by the Children's Hospital as an alcoholic syndrome baby. And she's a bit demanding of me and my time and uh, I couldn't manage with her my... The fellow that left, he said, you're doing a marvellous job. And uh, I said, if only in you, you know, I'm not really, I, I'm not coping that well. She's getting me down mentally. So I put her in a church home and I detached from those three older, older children. I don't go near them now and I don't have them over at the house where they only come over to nag at me when they're all full of dope and have goes at me. So I've um, detached from them. And that was six months ago, I've done all this. And I've really, rightly, only got sober since October, since I went through these steps and uh, had a look at myself. 
And today I'm very grateful for this fellowship of AA, what it's given me, because I am living one day at a time. I was not living one day at a time. I didn't understand what that meant. And that this was a daily program. I'm following this program to the best of my ability, living by it today. And it's been great results for me. I've got this inner happiness in this... uh, it's my first convention and it's lovely, you know, I've got this lovely inner happiness within me. And things have been really great, you know, and if I just keep it one day at a time to do his will and not my will, I hand over every morning and I don't ever forget of a night time. I do that tenth step in inventory and I thank my loving God, I found a loving God here in AA today and I'm very grateful to all you people for helping me. Thank you. My name's Bruce and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Bruce. Hi. Uh, geez, that was unexpected. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, uh, I'm a primary alcoholic. Uh, I started drinking at 14 and I was diagnosed an alcoholic six years later uh, and introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous through Lankin Clinic. And uh, like one of the speakers tonight, uh, that was about 19 or 20 years ago. Uh, unlike that speaker, uh, I wasn't uh, all that impressed with you members of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I... Uh, I was more impressed with the hospital I was in, you know. Uh, male and female patients, uh, a few of those patients, uh, I'm a bit nervous tonight, uh, they worry me a bit, microphones, but, uh, you know, a few of those patients had been exposed to AA, and they told me that they were alcoholics, and uh, I identify with these people, you know. And uh, But I wasn't impressed, as I say, with AA. Uh, my first meeting, I was more interested in making a quit at the, uh, the trots, you know. Uh, the patients were parked in uh, back of their uh, beds, but the, uh, the next meeting at, uh, at Ramsgate, uh, you know, uh, uh, every speaker that night talked about the makeup of the alcoholic and I identify very, very strongly. But I was uh, a bit different and uh, the difference being that uh, I hang around AA for eight years as an observer. Um, I believe looking back, uh, you know, I try to convince you people I should be here, you know. Um, there was times in this eight year twilight period that uh, I had to come to AA when I was in these sorts of places. But there was the other times, you know, when I was in the fits of despair and I'd crawl into a, a, a meeting like a mangy dog and uh, I never ever declared myself an alcoholic and I was very anonymous. I'd parked the company car three blocks away and all you knew about me was my name was Bruce and I lived down the block a couple of, a couple of blocks, you know. And, uh, and that was the way it was. And, uh, you know, I used to leave these meetings as an observer and uh, on my way back to the pub or the club, I'd start to say my story to myself, you know, uh, like I was imitating an AA speaker. My name was Bruce, and I left home at 14. I ended up shacked up here, there, and everywhere. And uh, this doctor said so and so, and the mother-in-law, the prospective mother-in-law, said something else. And I'd get up to the latest tale away, whether it was a hospitalisation or a suicidal attempt or whatever it was, and I'd say, you know, those bastards wouldn't understand, you know. And uh, the madness of today, you know, how could I possibly expect you to understand? I hadn't told you, you know. And, and this is the way it was, you know. But uh, many things kept me back, uh, coming back to this eight-year period. The uh, the hope that was generated at these meetings. Uh, the things they told me from the floor of a meeting because they had no chance before or after a meeting because I wasn't here. But for, from the floor of the meeting they told me that if I was an alcoholic, if I kept coming long enough, I'd hear my story told. And if I didn't get AA, maybe AA would get me. And on one occasion I took a seizure in a meeting at Newdown, you know, and I was carted off to an alcoholic hospital. And uh, an AA member paid the first week in advance. And I never found that out to, to many years later. But uh, this is the way it was for me. So... For that eight years, about the only thing I, I could, you know, you could say was that I kept coming, you know. And I eventually joined AA, you know, and uh, uh, I, uh, it was about 12 or 13 years ago. I got off the grog for 27 months, went to meetings nightly, and uh, all I was sharing for that 27 months in AA was experiences. And to do that, I had to be bombed out on Valium. And Valium was a dirty word in those days, and, but I felt justified in taking these things because I was told I needed them for the rest of my life. And I'd take these Valium, you know, before a meeting, and then I'd take a couple during the meeting if I, you know, hadn't been asked to speak. And at the end of the meeting, I'd take a couple more so I wouldn't drop the chairman, you know. And uh, I was mad, you know. And the meetings weren't long enough, you know. I was, uh, I was still running from life. I was running from the past. I was running from me. And, uh, you know, the, uh, my mind used to race at 100 mile an hour, and, uh, you know, about 20 past nine, I'd start to get a bit of calmness. And then, good night, nurse, see you tomorrow night. And I had to worry about not picking up a drink for 22 and a half hours. Again, looking back for that first 27 months of so-called membership of AA, I believe I was going to meetings because I was frightened I was going to drink on the way home. And I mentioned this one night, and one of the old timers said, you know, you won't have a compulsion until you pick the next one out. Uh, well, I don't know what I had, whether it was a burning obsession, desire, but I had it, you know. And this is the way it was. And eventually, after 27 months of uh, 
being misunderstood, you know. I, I, uh, you know, uh, it says in the big book, you know, to keep what you've got, you've got to give it away. And I thought I had heaps to give, and I thought there must be somebody out there like me. And I got involved in a bit of social work, and I, I, I went in there with the right reasons, and, um, but, uh, you know, the madness, you know, I mean, uh, how could I help somebody else and I couldn't help me bloody self, you know? And uh, this particular night in question, uh, I knew if I didn't talk to somebody at gut level, I would drink. And uh, AA had said, whatever you do, don't drink. And it was rather ironic this particular night that I'd done part of the fifth step with a, a girl I was working with. And, uh, you know, and to me, that was the, the first high, highlight of my association in AA because and for other alcoholics, it must be different or is different, but it was sort of like I was, you know. I found it very, very hard to trust, you know, and uh, and over the years, many people tried to get the clues on what made me tick, but uh, all to no avail, you know. And this particular night, as I say, I'd done part of the fifth step, and uh, over the next couple of weeks, I told this person my whole life story from go to way. And then I got a bit worried, and I took her out, and we got married a couple of weeks later. And uh, I'm not playing to the crowd, you know, there's people here that know this is true, you know. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, that's the answer, you know. But it wasn't, because I drank again, and the madness was back. And the first four months I was married, I was in and out of AA like a yo-yo, and I was, uh, there was hospitalisations, and I'm not being dramatic, I believe, well, I know I play my story down from the floor of a meeting, but the only way by this stage that I could get off the piss was to, to be hospitalised, and uh, there was a, 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 at least four hospitalisations in the next 12 months, and, uh, and I ended up at the army in Sam at Lidcombe, and uh, it was about eight, or eight and a half years, nine, nine years ago, and I choose to believe I've been petting them in AA since then, you know. Uh, the psych- it was a total of 20 hospitalisations for alcoholism, which is no record, but it was enough for me. And I reached a stage where I had to get up or die. And I'd heard that expression over the years in AA, and I used to think to myself, you know, that's bunging it on a bit, and it's rather dramatic. But that's the way it was when I hit the old men's home at Lidcombe. The ha-ha was gone, you know. And uh, the psychologist said, told me everything that you people have tried to tell me, you know, for so many years. You know, he told me that AA was the only answer. He told me I'd have to get back to it. Um, he told me many things. You know, he said that if I was for Edinkham, I don't have to go through withdrawal once, and, uh, you know, there was many other things he, he told me. And every argument I put up with this guy, why I couldn't make it in AA, you know, like I've been around so long and I've failed so often, and this bastard upset me and somebody else said something else, you know. Whatever it was, you know, he, he just shot me down in flames, and uh, I got introduced myself the first time in life. And as I said earlier, you know, I choose to believe I've been fitting with AA. Along the way I got out of there, I got back to AA, got back to the workforce, uh, got back to the wife, and we got transferred up to Port Macquarie. And uh, my world fell apart up there. I uh, I found that I missed the get-up-or-die city attitude of AA. And, uh, you know, and I felt that I was being taken on face fee. You know, you members in Port Macquarie, you know, uh, you're only taken on face fee. You know, you hadn't seen me in full flight. And, uh, you know, and I was running to Sydney of a weekend. Thank Christ it was a company car, you know, because uh, I was uh, doing miles and miles, you know, and uh, trying to regain this so-called serenity or calmness or whatever I, I had at that time. And, uh, you know, but I, I still, still wasn't basically honest, you know, I was, uh, I was still thinking the same as I was, and, uh, I, uh, I hadn't cleaned house, I hadn't, I hadn't done anything, you know, and, uh, anyhow, I picked up another drink, I mean, I found that my drinking changed, I found that I just couldn't get out of the house, and, uh, this surprised me, because, uh, even though basically I'm a loner, I've, uh, up to this stage, I had to at least see faces and hear voices, you know, and crawl into a pub or a club like a mangy dog, but, uh, uh, I ended up, you know, drinking at home and, uh, you know, the wife had shot through and um, the local members rallied around and tried to get me back to AA. Uh, relations from Sydney and AA, you know, that I'd found that I had, uh, they come up and uh, no way could I make a comeback. And I was just drinking myself out. And um, uh, one of my many stages, you know, I started correspond overseas many years ago as a loaner sponsor. And then I reversed the roles and I started to, to write to these loaner sponsors for help myself, you know, but... Uh, uh, they used to send tapes of American speakers, you know, and I never ever played these damn things, and I'd stop writing to these bloody people there because they were too straight for me, you know. They, you know, if I was going through self-pity or anything, they'd tell me to pull myself together. And, uh, you know, so I put a few of these tapes on that I'd acquired over the years, you know, and these speakers talk for an hour, an hour and a half, and I'm not going to try and talk that long tonight, but they, they talk about their childhood, they talk about their active alcoholism, and they talk about the recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. And to me, they also talk a lot more about the emotional side of this disease. And listening to these speakers for an hour and a half, uh, I was going one better than that. I'd put a blank into the cassette and play my story into it, and that's why I'm a bit nervous of mics tonight. And then I was playing myself, back to myself and adjudicating on what I said, you know. And uh, I'm my own worst critic at the best of times, you know. But, uh, you know, I was listening to myself, poor little Brucey boy, you know. I cut my wrist before I got into Betrick Hospital. It was the third time in Lincoln Clinic before I graduated to Hyderbray. 
And what year was it in that I got the Wisteria house, you know? <laughs> and this was a sort of the madness, you know? And over and over to myself again, I was playing myself, you know? And something that Minogue told me many years ago at, uh, at Idabro, you know, he suggested I get out in the scrub and find myself, and I'd had a lot of walkabouts, and uh, so I'd, I'd had a couple of so, so-called sober trips in AA all out the back blocks of Queensland when I was bombed out on Valium, and I'd stayed with lone members, and uh, I made this pilgrimage to uh, to make a comeback to AA, and uh, I'd get to these one-horse towns, and, uh, you know, I'd talk myself out of going, you know, I know she wouldn't be interested, or, he, you know, he'd be sick of me, or, you know, and all the rest of it. And so I was working my way back to Port Macquarie, but... Uh, through a chain of circumstances, I, I come into a meeting a little over seven years ago now at Crowsness, and since that night I've been told in AO of change, you know. And today I know this to be true because uh, along the way in the last seven and a bit years, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous has proved to me that I don't have to drink. You know, it's uh, released me of this obsession, compulsion and desire to drink. It hasn't made me a saint, uh, you know. The only reason I don't throw lawnmowers around is I haven't got a lawnmower, you know. But, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't easy. I, uh, you know... Uh, Six months sober the last time, and uh, again, I was, you know, keeping myself together. I uh, found it very hard to trust and talk at gut level, and I was basically doing it on my own, and, um, you know, a woman member at Warhope suggested I, I told her I was doing a bit of an AO trip, you know, and she said, uh, call in and see so-and-so in Canberra and uh, give her this message or give her this note or somebody. And I got down to Canberra, and I, uh, I'd met this woman once before in Canberra at a convention up at uh, Port Macquarie, and... Uh, I drove around the, the block for about three or four times, and I thought, well, eventually I thought, well, I'll go in, and if she asked me very nicely, uh, I'll stay for ten minutes for a cup of tea. You know? And uh, I ended up staying four days and four nights, and uh, she became my sponsor, and uh, I only found out yesterday she died. But, uh, you know, uh, she was a great help to me, and, uh, you know, I'm not putting it up on a pedestal, but having got the help from this particular woman uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous six and a half years ago. I find in my case now, today, I can talk to certain people in AA at gut level, and this has been proved good for me, and I can only say how alcoholism, you know, affected me and uh, and how I've learned through Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I tried to do the piss step about 13 years ago in AA, and uh, this particular night in question, I wasn't actually a member at the time, but I was... Uh, at a meeting at Newdown, and uh, everyone was talking about the, you know, get calm, this peace of mind, do the fifth step. And I speared this bloke after meeting, and I said, I want to do the fifth step with you now. And he said, not me, Dak. He said, no. He said, if I drink, he said, if you, if I drink tomorrow, he said, you might drink too. Now whether he's right or wrong is beside the point, but he's still sober today. But I can only say, as I say, how it affects me. And uh, having uh, got this sponsor in Camper, and uh, and letting her see me as I really was. Um, um, you know, I find now that I can talk to other people in AA, and it's been good for me because the sort of guy I am, if I can get myself into a spin, some bastard upsets me. If a bit of the past comes up, if I start to doubt my story, or if I start to feel insecure in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I don't have to go running back to square one when I was 14. I just go back to the last time I've seen the person that knows me, and we kick on from there. I'm making progress in other areas. Uh, as I tried to say earlier, for a long time in AA, I was flat out sharing experiences. Tonight, I believe at times I can share a certain amount of strength and hope. Apart from sharing this, I'd like to share the time and thanks for listening. Thank you, mate. Faye. Faye? Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Faye and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, and I've also been addicted to mood and mind changing drugs. Well, I started off about the age of 29 with a little bottle with 50 Valium, you know, and I took these Valium for a few years in an alcoholic manner that I didn't realise until now, and then I became addicted to whiskey, and I was on whiskey and pills for many, many years. I knew what it was, you know, to pawn things in and out of pawn shops. I had good jobs. I had an army allotment. I had three kids, but I still was in and out of pawn shops. I had blackouts, I was dirty, I wasn't washed. I did everything, I suppose, that a wife and a mother shouldn't do. But all along the line, I found an excuse for Faye. You know, this one made me do this, this one did me do, made me do that. And I continued on this way for many, many years, more years than I care to remember. And then eventually, I left my husband, or I guess he was glad I left him, and I ended up, I had nothing or nobody in the world but three kids. And these kids washed me, fed me, 
kept me off a river bank and kept me out of a jail. And one day, I don't, by, the, by way of the child welfare, I came in contact with Alcoholics Anonymous and I went to Alcoholics Anonymous and I fell in the door drunk. You know, and I drank on the next day and then early the next morning I woke up and I looked at Faye. I looked at a dirty house, an empty fridge and three kids and I picked up a phone and I called a doctor and for the first time in my life I admitted I was an alcoholic and I needed help desperately. And I committed myself to Morissette and I came off Valium and I came off Whiskey. And today I realise that that little pill I thought was so innocent was far more dangerous to me than any bottle of Whiskey. And I came out of Morissette, I went back to Alcoholics Anonymous in Tamworth. I forgot to tell you, I belong to the Tamworth group of Al Alcoholics Anonymous. And here, for the first time, or I'm saying for the first time in my life, I knew real love human kindness, and things I'd never, never really had in my life before. People didn't want to con me. They didn't want anything from me. They just wanted to see me get well. And this was a beautiful, beautiful experience for me. And I not only knew this love for me and myself, I knew it for my children. And it was beautiful. And I progressed along in Alcoholics Anonymous. The first job I got when I was sober was pumping petrol, you know, and I was going to put petrol into the wrong end of a Volkswagen one day. That's how mad I was. But I did it. I was so mad. Uh, and it was good money, and I had three kids. And then I took on a job as a cook in a private hospital, you know, and I put those two eldest kids through teacher's college, and the youngest one was coming along nice. And then I become something a man many, many years before had told me in Morissette, and I met this man today, and it was beautiful. And this man spoon-fed me when I was in Morissette, not only with food when I couldn't work, eat. He spoon-fed me with kindness and love, and I didn't realize just what this man did for me. And I have remembered him down the road of Alcoholics Anonymous for many, many days. And today, sitting in this hall, I looked up and I thought I saw a ghost, and I saw this man. And this beautiful man I knew when I looked at him wasn't at peace with himself. And I talked to him afterwards, and... It, I was very, very sad, but it was beautiful to think I met this man again here this weekend, and I know I'm breaking into my story, but I was so happy to meet this person again. But I became involved with somebody, and this man had told me many years before, never react to feelings, react to facts. Alcoholics cannot handle emotions. And through this emotion, I, became, I came into the contact of drugs again, I got onto a tablet called Largactrol after the death of this person and uh, I had an involuntary movement of the mouth and tongue that never stopped 24 hours a day for two years. And I stayed away from Alcoholics Anonymous. But when I did come back to Alcoholics Anonymous, I came back a different person. No more pride, no more arrogance, nothing. They was humble. I was ready for you people this program and for God to teach me and you have done this and it, it's a beautiful way of life I'm very happy to be here this weekend to share with you it's lovely I love you all you people this program and God have returned me a mother to three beautiful kids I can't express my gratitude but I'm very very happy thank you and God bless you Jim Jim My name's Kevin and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm a member of the group that meets uh, in Sydney at the Martyr Hospital on Sunday morning. Uh, gee, I don't know. I, like a lot of us, uh, at various stages at meetings, I sit there and think, if I'm called, I'll say this, and if I'm called, I'll say that. I have no, I have no wisdom. Uh... The only wisdom I have is, is you people. The only, <coughs> the only life I have today is you people. You restored my sanity. Three and a half years ago, you, you restored my physical health. 
and you restored my, my spiritual health. After a lifetime of drinking, I, I was drunk when I was seven. That's the first time I remember being drunk. Like a lot of people, uh, I don't really remember when I picked up my first drink, but it was before I was seven. I drank uh, for the next 36 years uh, through uh, a primary education drinking, a secondary education drinking, uh, and a further education drinking, and through a career that took me... Uh, seemingly successfully overseas for a number of years drinking, giving me, I thought, a lot of, well, it was giving me a lot of confidence. Uh, it's alcohol seemed to give me a lot of things. As uh, Bede from Randwick often says, uh, what a confidence trick alcohol is. And it, it was for me. It was such a rip-off. But as it turns out, it was a rip-off with a silver lining because today I have you and you have me, uh, which I don't know. I, I guess that's pretty good. Because we're all one. Uh, I was at a meeting yesterday and unity was spoken about. Uh, I don't want to talk about unity within the fellowship now, but this, this uni unity that I know we are one, and as we all recover, I recover. And as I recover, we all recover. Uh, it was terrific to hear Pat tonight. Uh, I love to hear Pat speak because she speaks of the example of another alcoholic to her. And to me, Pat is a great example of, of wisdom and courage and love. My sponsor, <coughs> I'm finding it very difficult, obviously, but my sponsor uh, gives me everything. Through the serenity that I have most of the time in my sobriety today, I am able to, to function as, a, for most of the time, a, a reliable member of society. Uh, I found it personally very rewarding to hear uh, the Governor-General speak of the, the other night of the contribution that we can make to society and that Alcoholics Anonymous does make to society. Uh, with my sort of calculating brain, when he was talking about the figures, we come up with a figure of $3.5 million a year in counselling, uh, and that's uh, that's not to be sneezed at, I think. Uh, I just think it's terrific to be able to function again. I, in the spiritual areas, I, I find, particularly as with everything else in the in the program, but particularly in that area, I have to keep it very simple. I've I've, re I've rediscovered uh, a higher power that I was that I was brought up in and that I rejected. Uh, I found this power again, or this power has found me, and it's a remarkable experience for me. But if I overcomplicate it, as I, as I have done at various stages, it does not become a remarkable experience. That's all I think I, I'd like to say tonight, but just thank you. Clive. Evening, everybody. My name's Clive, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, um, Clive. Well, I think I'm lucky. I can remember what I thought I'd talk about if I got called tonight while I was sitting there. Um, so I'll talk about that. I was uh, last Christmas at my brother's place for the Christmas gathering, and uh, my father's dead. My uh, one of my brothers is gone, and my younger brother's a successful, uh, very successful, rich businessman. Uh, divorcee with children, and there were lots of lovely ladies about, and gilded slippers thrown in corners, and hand, you know, hams, and too much food, and too much booze, and lots of dope being smoked. And I thought, what am I doing here? And uh, I received a letter from somebody I had something to do with in AA in London, and. Uh, it happened to be delivered on Christmas Day. It was a great letter. And I lied down on the floor as my mother was sitting on the floor and uh, put my head in the lap and read this letter. And I think it's... Uh, I really don't know. It's got to be uh, at least 30 years since I did that. And for me, uh, that felt exceptionally good. 
because uh, every lover I ever had always smelt like my mother, I know that. Uh, so there had to be something, you know, there was a smell and a feel and a touch and a homeliness and something that I hadn't experienced for so long. And uh, I'm finding a similar thing here this weekend. I'm finding a similar thing in AA because uh, for me, having paid my dues and arrived at AA and got sober overseas, uh, I sort of got it easy in a funny sort of way because I didn't have to walk around the corner and bump into Fred, who I ripped off last week, or Frida, who I knocked out last month, or whatever. Uh, I actually sort of got on a time and space machine and flew back into my past, and, and that was pretty freaky because... Suddenly I was met at a plane by my younger brother, who I had very loving memories of and told myself that I was the person I loved most in the world. And through my new eyes, I, I had to actually look at this person and say, well, gee, that's really my younger brother. That's the guy I grew up with. That's the guy I used to fight with. You know, This is the sort of the person that I knew and lived with until I was 17 years old, and I didn't know him. I'd never seen him before. And uh, I was born at Mascot, and I lived at Mascot, and I walked through Mascot and drove through Mascot, and I'd never been there before. Really, I hadn't. I could get in a car, and I could instinctively know which were one-way streets and which weren't. I had that much of a retentive memory, but basically then I had to look at Australia and Australians and uh, all sorts of things with my new eyes. And uh, I live with my younger brother, who, as I said, is a very successful businessman in his flat, with his friends, eating his food, driving his car on his time. And I tried desperately to educate this man into uh, understanding me. And it didn't work, you see. All he could do is accept me, because as far as he's concerned, I'm still a nut. Uh, you know, I'm still a Martian. I'm still, but he's still somebody who did all those insane, freaky things, which uh, he just doesn't understand. You know, I think he wasn't even born young, um, but I, I think I was... I think I've never been old, you know, in a funny sort of two-and-a-half-year-old way. And uh, we really are quite different. He is my family of the blood, but he's not my family of the heart, you see, because I could stand up here and talk and not even finish the sentence, and I'm pretty sure that 98% of the people in the room would understand what I'm talking about. And that's fantastic. That really is fantastic. It's that same feeling I got when I, when I lie down on the floor and put my head in my mother's lap. And uh, Pat talked about the search. Well, for me again, it was a search also. I turned over lots of rocks and lots of people and lots of countries and lots of situations. And uh, mine was a long search. And uh, I found what I was looking for. In a way, I was successful. All my, all my failure, if you like, or all my programming for, for not being successful, all my refusal to accept the responsibility of succeeding, got me here. And so, in a way, I was successful. In a way, I found what I was searching for. And if I did find what I was searching for, and I'm quite sure I did, you know, there's no reason for me to hold back. There's no me reason for me to be afraid. But, you know, I still suffer from this, this ego disease, so, uh, at times I'm reticent and at times I suffer, uh, a little bit less and a little bit less all the time. I am getting remarkably better. I'm uh, even at times proud of myself. I think I like myself to a great degree, uh, much more than I did. I'm, I'm, I'm finding that the best thing that ever happened to me was accepting the responsibility of, of, of me you know, I am responsible for how I feel, and I am responsible for my health and stuff like that. Um, mental as well as physical, you know, so therefore uh, I have to sort of live up to that. And there's an old man, I I'm, could tell you um, a drunk log too, but I'd rather not. I'd rather share a couple of exciting things which happened to me, and it was <coughs> a very old man who was talking about painting pictures actually, but it, it goes for other things, and he said, um, responsibility without freedom is slavery. And slavery without, you know, uh, freedom without responsibility is anarchy. So, for me, I, I find that the answer to the, what I want is, I still think like a, is balance. 
I find I still think totally in absolutes like a child. You know, if it's white and it doesn't look great white, then I'll think totally opposite, painted black. Uh, you know, what I need is, is a balance and uh, to live in the minute and the now. And uh, for me, for me, it works that way. I think the thing that I was searching for all that time, besides something spiritual, was freedom. I really do. I think that's why I rejected authority and all sorts of things on all state. And I find that I am forced to acknowledge now that I, that I am given total freedom by AA. My problem is, is how to use it and how to pick it up and how to be responsible enough towards myself. You see, I'm my, my own most good and I am the battleground. And I'm the one that buggers it up every single time because I'm the one that keeps expecting things of me. You know, I'm not a superstar, I'm just an alcoholic. And uh, I have to try and keep it simple, and that, that is, is difficult. All I can do is say thank you very much uh, for releasing me of the prison of myself on a lot of fronts. And uh, I am very proud to be here. Thank you. Would you like a thing? Good evening, everybody. I'm Aileen, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Aileen. And I come from the Manning area. I say the Manning area because we've got such a lot of meetings in the Foster Town Curry groups uh, and Tari groups. Um, I need this meeting tonight. Oh, God, how I needed it. Um, I haven't been very happy at the convention, really, uh, but I am now. I've, I've got a great deal of serenity since I sat in and listened to other people's experiences. My story runs back to front. I was first taken to AA before I even had picked up a drink by a very dear friend who uh, came from the Newcastle area and who died just a few months after I got into AA through alcoholism. And uh, I, I had known quite a lot of the wonderful things that could happen to people and I saw what happened to Frank and how wonderful he was in AA and yet it didn't stop me from picking up a drink because I firmly believed that God had this plan in mind for me to know that, you know, that I should go through this hell, this private hell, and come out a better person. And so I hung round AA. This happened in 1960. And uh, I hung round AA for such a long time. And uh, I was going because my husband, that I was married to then, the father of my children, was a very bad drinker, a good man, a good worker, and uh, he, but he liked his booze. And he suffered alcoholic blackouts. Eventually he suffered a seizure, which took him. And then I was left entirely alone. And I say alone because from my earliest childhood, um, we, I came from a family of eight. Uh, we didn't have much money, but we didn't lack in love in our family. And um, then through the war years, the six years that he was away, I still lived with my family. And then I formed a family of my own with the help of my husband. And for those years... Up to 34 years of marriage, I hadn't been alone. And when he died, I was completely at a loss. And I got around like a chook with its head cut off. And I had a good, comfortable home, but I still wasn't happy and I couldn't live with me. However, I um, said, as I said, I hung around AA. And uh, I thought I was going because I wanted to know how to live with this man who had this drinking problem. At the same time, I was drinking, but not at the same place as him because I used to get so embarrassed about him. These were the fun years for me, and I was embarrassed because he used to make me feel so bad when I'd go drinking with him. However, uh, through all this time, um, I still didn't see that it was me that needed AA. I couldn't get him interested, and uh, he died as a, of a seizure suddenly one good Friday night. And uh, I still hung around AA. I still thought I was going because I had perhaps a son now that was, that was drinking 
and becoming an alcoholic. But finally it did get to me. I hung around AA so long, it's not funny. I beat the other man that said he hung around for five years. I went around for ten. And uh, one night at a meeting at the hospital, something was said and the penny dropped. And I went down, I rang Tom. Could he pick me up? I was so sick I couldn't even ring the NRMA to come and fix the, the tyre on my little mini. I had the phone in the house, but I couldn't pick it up. I rang Tom. I said, please, would you come and take me to the meeting? And he took me to the meeting. And I got up and I thought I was going to tell them all, you know, and they'd be all surprised that Aileen was an alcoholic, you know. But they'd been praying for me all these years, <laughs> and <laughs> they knew. And uh, I know one night that there was an Alnon uh, lady there and she came to me and she said, and I still didn't wake up, that's how befuddled I was, she said, uh, would you like to come to Alnon with us, Aileen, or do you think you'd like to be here? And I said, no, this is my place here. It still didn't enter my head that I was the alcoholic. But I've had, uh, I haven't, since then I haven't, um, I've been lucky, I haven't had to pick up a drink. But I went on for about 18 months and uh, then it set in. The honeymoon period was over and I started to get the electric fleas. And, you know, like me, the alcoholic, I had to do it, uh, as I say, uh, cold chook because we couldn't afford turkey. And I did it all. And I even put the smokes down, but I've taken it up again the last 12 months because <laughs> I had a rather shattering experience about 12 months ago and I felt... Fortunately, when I come out of the house, I said to my brother-in-law, who's standing there with a tinny in his hand, oh, God, I'd love a drink. And he, he went up the shed and got me a, a tin Coke. And uh, But my girlfriend handed me a smoke. And uh, there I am, still on them. But that'll go down one of these days. I think one thing at a time is enough for me. But I've had my ups and downs in AA, uh, sometimes depressed. But I'm getting a great deal of serenity. And uh, I know it has changed my life. And um, it is a wonderful way of life. And, and I'm very, very grateful to be a member of AA. I hear people sometimes say that, um, you know, that uh, they were born alcoholics. It doesn't matter how you become an alcoholic. But I've heard this said, but I firmly believe alcohol causes alcoholism. And I firmly believe that I had all the tendencies prior to that because I didn't drink until I was 40. I was brought up in a Salvation Army uh, life at home and taken to Sunday school. And at the time that I did eventually pick up a drink, I was teaching Sunday school and taking my children off to Sunday school and being a good mother. And in defiance, I thought that God was being very cruel to me. And in rebellion, I, I did go out and pick up a drink. And so I had some fun years, I must admit that. But the disease started to take hold me and my life became hell and I know that after my husband died my mother the dear little Salvation Army lady that I love so much and the young man spoke about the fragrance of his mother my mother is a little fragrant woman too and we all love the smell of our mothers and um, I know she said to me after my husband's death but it could have been the cause of Jim's death and, you know, I think that contributed to my, uh, not I didn't pick up a drink, but to my, re, my regression in AA. Uh, for about eight months I didn't go. I wanted to commit suicide. I, I thought of all these terrible things. I didn't realise. It took me a long time to, to come to the point where people were saying that I wasn't guilty. And finally it came home to me that I wasn't guilty. I, didn't, I wasn't responsible for what my husband did. And um, and I shed that guilt. It was only through the, the teachings from AA, the good advice I got from you dear people, that cleared myself of this terrible thing I had. Uh, I had this nice home, as I said, and I used to throw things around the place of a night time when I came home so that I could pick them up next morning and make myself do some work. Uh, I, I was in a terrible state mentally. Physically, it didn't do much to me. I used to say I didn't go to hospital. I didn't, wasn't put into a hospital, and I did. I went in with a, you know, nervous breakdown. Uh, nobody said to me, you know, do you think you ought to get on the program? 
but eventually, you know, it came to me and I did. And I've, I've never been, uh, my life since then, in, this happened in 1977, and um, things changed for me. Uh, I was down in Sydney doing geographical, and uh, the man I was involved with was a drinker too, but his boys gave me the most trouble, and I realised that I was getting out of the frying pan into the fire. I would come home to my own home, and I would be a mother and a grandmother because I had almost lost my children through this and I came home and I tried to go back to the club just to play carpet bowls somehow or other the desire for drink had left me before I realised I was just sick of drinking you know, I really was I was sick of drinking and I used to go back and I'd try to play carpet bowls and try to drink a couple of squashes and I, I just couldn't enjoy it so I came home, I remember coming home before I called Tom and I said to myself, you know, I'll stay in this house and that's just what I'll do. I'll just stay in this house, I'll exist without anybody, but I couldn't make it without AA because I knew, I knew that there was a place that I could get peace. And I too was brought up with the God of fear. And finally I came to, to realise that it was the God of love. However, you know, with all these wonderful things, and I, I went on a tour early in, in that year, and I met a man who wanted to keep travelling around Australia, and he asked me to marry him, and by the end of that year, we were married, and we've done some wonderful trips. I'm very grateful to him. I complain about him sometimes. I wonder to myself whether I've done the wrong thing or the right thing. But um, he doesn't ask me, and doesn't put any restrictions on me, and I can go to as many meetings as I like. He keeps the car on the road for me. All I do is put the petrol in it. I don't even put water or air in the tyres or anything like that. But he keeps it on the road for me, and I've got a lot to be grateful for this way, you know. He brought me up to, to um, Armadale this weekend, and he's filling in his time revisiting old people and old friends of his and getting his own meals and that sort of thing while I'm enjoying the company of you beautiful people. I've seen two lots of people today that, uh, in, in the last couple of days that I've met before and uh, realised what a wonderful love and, and, and fellowship there is and how grateful I am to God that he's given me and AA has given me this second chance of this wonderful life that I have. Now, I have my children who rely on me as a babysitter occasionally, something they wouldn't trust me with when I was drinking. And this is something, it's so wonderful. I had a birthday a couple of weeks ago when I turned 60 and I had a dinner party up there at their place and it was a wonderful time. My son still has a few drinks, but prior to this Christmas 12 months, he uh, came home very, very drunk and started to pick on me and I was ready to go to a meeting in Wingham. And I know that, you know, just through the, the very fact that I had learned to hang on to that little bit of serenity, I walked to the door and said, don't worry, Jeff, I won't be coming. You won't ever insult me in your house again because I won't be coming back. And, of course, he wanted to put his arm around me and kiss me. I shrugged him off. I walked out the door with all the pride and dignity I could muster. As soon as I got in the car to drive down to the meeting, I dissolved into tears and fell on the boy's shoulders when I got there. But I knew that they understood me. And uh, since then, my son came down for Christmas that day, a uh, few, few weeks after, and there hasn't been a word spoken between either of us. But I know that my sobriety and my life in AA has spoiled his drinking just a little, that one day, through the example that perhaps I have shown of the change in me, that he may say, well, Mum's got something. And I pray every day and every night for this because I've only got one son and one daughter and I love them very much. And uh, But I'm trusted with their wonderful children and I'm very, very grateful, as I've said before. And uh, my heart's very full because, as I said, I really needed this meeting tonight. Things hadn't been going. I think I was just overtired. I think, you know, we, we don't realise how sick we are. But I realise now that, that this has been a wonderful meeting 
and I don't care how long it goes on. But I'm very, very grateful tonight. Thank you very much. Filling a bill. Thanks, Trevor. Good night, everyone. I'm Bill and I'm an alcoholic. Thank you. Uh, I didn't expect this tonight. <laughs> I've had a couple of goes this weekend and uh, I've enjoyed the meeting tonight very much. But me, alcoholic. I drank very early and uh, right from my very first drink, I had no control whatsoever. I didn't know it then. I thought my behaviour was the same as anyone else's. I didn't know the, 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 uh, that I was any different to anybody else. But uh, I now know, on looking back, that I had no control. The only control that I had in my early drinking was the amount of money I had in my pocket. So I can't take any credit for that. And uh, very quickly, drink took over and directed me where I went, how I behaved and what I did and what have you. And uh, I didn't particularly like what was happening, but I was unable to do anything about it. And I would never have said that right there and then. If anybody had have asked me, could I stop or could I do this, I'd have said, if I wanted to, but I don't want to. Uh, however, as time went on, I was to uh, walk off the family property uh, and I don't know why, but this is the insanity of this sickness, I believe. The rows that I was causing in my, my parents' home with my brothers and sisters, uh, and I felt a tremendous guilt about this because I knew it was me that was causing these upheavals in the family circle, and I was unable to do anything about it. So I decided I would leave home, and I did this on many occasions, and my father... Uh, in his sincerity to try and help me would bring me back into the family circle and uh, take up a position on the property again and, but there was always one condition that I didn't drink or excessively and that was impossible I may do it for a little while but invariably I would uh, pick up the drink again and I would go to town with a load of fruit perhaps on Monday morning and turn up on Friday. And this is the thought of behaviour. And I was wondering why the, the old man was getting a bit niggly on me. Uh, at the age of 16, though, my youngest brother came home from college once and I had a cattle dog. And he said to me on this particular occasion, you know, Nugget, he said, if ever you come home sober, that dog would bite you because he wouldn't know you. And that would be pretty right too because on every occasion I went to town I never ever intended to get drunk. I only ever went in to have a couple. I never wanted to get drunk. I just wanted that feeling, that contentment and that comfortable feeling that I had right from my very first drink. But I was never able to maintain that level. I always went that bit further. And I never ever remember having enough to say that, right, I'll stop now, I'm full enough, I'll go home and go to bed. The only time I had enough was when the pubs closed or I couldn't get any more or when I flaked out. So this was the pattern of my life for a good number of years. And we hear a lot about the geographicals in AA and I went on the moor. Every place I was going to go to, every place I went to, it was going to be different. And it was. It was worse. And uh, the trouble I was getting into with the police, with the... And the funny thing, I was only thinking there, this afternoon somebody mentioned about the trouble I had with magistrates. And uh, I always got into trouble with them uh, too, because uh, I was a pretty arrogant sort of a fellow. And uh, I remember once the magistrate in the Orange Court, and that's the town I come from, uh, uh, was uh, he knew my family and he was dressing me down very severely. To, he was telling me to pull my socks up and that my family, uh, you know, that uh, 
I was making a holy show of them and what have you. And I let him have his little spiel, and when he'd finished, I said, you can drop dead, you rotten mongrel. <laughs> and it cost me another th three quid. <laughs> now, the fine for drunk in those days was five bob. Now, three quid was a hefty fine. And I always wanted that last say, though. And th th this was me as an alky. Couldn't keep my big mouth shut. And I've got a job to do today, too, I might have. Uh, Trevor doesn't know what he's let himself in for. <laughs> he's given me the mic. But uh, through this success of drinking, I was to go a lot of places that I didn't want to go, and I did a lot of things that I didn't want to do. And as I know it now, it was all against my will, all against my better judgment. And uh, although I lost all this... Uh, material stuff in the beginning of or, or early in my drinking uh, and my position in the family and what have you and the love and uh, uh, the family the brothers and sisters and parents and what have you the thing that started to go was my dignity the self-respect and that was bad but then after many years of trouble and uh, what have you uh, I lost hope and that was when the real trouble started. I just didn't give a damn anymore. I didn't care. I accepted the fact that I was a drunk and that's the way I was going to die a drunk. And I was terrified of, of that fact, that I was going to die somewhere unknown, unwanted, unloved in the gutter. And this was going to be my existence. And I was to go on like this for quite a while. I did try on many occasions to, to stop drinking. I took pledges and uh, I took a prohibition order out against myself and all these sorts of things and nothing to work. And fortunately for me, I was introduced to AA. And uh, I went very well in the city for, for a period of 12 months and then I went back to the bush. And there wasn't any AA there. And I cut myself off from the lifeline. And I believed, and I really believed this at the time, that I would never, ever drink again. I'd had enough. And I thought, armed with the knowledge that AA had, AA, AA had given me, that I'd be able to never pick up another drink. But I did. Because all I'd succeeded in doing, apparently, as I look back on it now, was at... Uh, attacked the physical side of my sickness. I didn't worry about the other two sides. And I knew and I believed what I'd heard in AA that I suffered with this threefold sickness. And anyhow, I drank again. And uh, I was to know a devastation and a remorse and despair in that period of drinking. I never, ever want to forget that either. Because if I do, I may pick up another drink. I want to remember all that because that's my safeguard about picking up that first drink. And I really believed that AA hadn't worked for me. It never entered my head that I hadn't worked for AA. I believed, as I'd heard in AA, read out this chapter 5 where there were people incapable of being honest with themselves. And I was such a dishonest beggar that I thought this was me, because I had never been honest in my life. Long before ever I picked up the first drink, I wasn't honest. I didn't become dishonest because I drank. I was dishonest before I drank. And I believe today, and I really believe this too, that my life didn't become unmanageable because I drank. My life was unmanageable and that's why I drank. That's my belief. And I believe that uh, when I threw the towel in and there's people here in the hall that have heard my story before but my last drink was at Lake Canobles at Orange and uh, I tried to do away with myself I'd heard about the wet brain uh, and I, I, I really thought that either I'd drink myself into a wet brain or I'll kill myself and I had this tin of methylated spirits and I drank it as much as I could have, but I don't know how much I drank, and that doesn't matter. But that was the, 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 the method in my madness was either to have the wet brain and I wouldn't care, or I was going to kill myself, and either way it didn't matter. 
But neither of those happened. The wet brain part nearly did, I think, but not quite. I had enough uh, sanity left to know what I had to do, that I had to get back to AA. And at this particular stage, I didn't believe, think I believed in God. I didn't have any faith in God at any rate. But I did ask for help. And I, 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 I never want to forget this either. And I did for a long time after I became sober. I asked this God that I didn't believe in, and this is the prayer, and I can remember it today, that I, uh, I added, I'd please God help me. I don't care what it is that I've got to do, but I'll do it. Take my arms and my legs, and I don't care, but I've got to stop drinking to live. And I knew it. And I haven't had a drink from that day to this. And it wasn't such a long while after that that I forgot about that. You know, and uh, I used to buck on that second step. The insanity, I wouldn't have it. And 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 and, and one day after a meeting at, at, at Burwood, or one night at least, I'd gotten up and I said about this... Uh, and I was sober approximately three years at this period. And uh, I said, I can't wear this spiritual side and I can't wear the God angle, you know. And I was just putting on a show as I know it now. And after the meeting was over, a little fellow came over to me. He said, come here, grumble guts. <laughs> he said, I've heard your story. He said, and I've heard you talk up and talk about that last trick you had at Lake Canobles. He said, and you've got God in your hip cock pocket and he said and you're too bloody stupid to see it and he was dead set right and I needed that too and uh, my approach to AA as it has been said up here tonight was all wrong I did everything back to front but I had to do it that way to prove that the program was right and I don't believe, and I really tr and truly don't as I said here the other morning, I don't believe the program is hard but overcoming bull to do the program is hard. There's nothing in that program that's hard. And, uh, because I wouldn't be sober here tonight if it was. And I really believe that too. I've been very, very fortunate since I came to AA. God and the fellowship and the friends I've met in AA have been very, very kind to me. In the beginning they were very tolerant. They put up with my shocking attitude, my... Oh, arrogance, my goodness and I don't know how they did they must have been nearly saints those early members of AA to put up with me but they did thank God and I'm here tonight and uh, I owe it all to AA and the God that I accept I still don't understand God but he understands me and he must have a pretty good sense of humor you know he puts up with me and uh, he must be a very tolerant God too but thank you for sharing it here thank you. Maureen, would you like to speak? Is there any lady members here that would like to speak? Irena? No. Good evening, my name's Irena and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. And I'm a member of the Newcastle City Group and uh, I'm saved a day. Can you hear me down the back? Yes. I'm saved today through the grace of God and the fellowship of AA, and for that I am very grateful. Um, I've already spoken at this convention, um, at the sponsorship workshop, so I won't say too much. Um, I've been sober a little over two years, and uh, uh, last year we went to the Adelaide convention, and Adam was two weeks old, and this year is one year and two weeks old. And uh, but this year also... My mum and my dad have come along, and that's tremendous for me. Uh, mum's been sober a little over a year, and uh, the blessings that I have received in this fellowship um, are absolutely wonderful. Um, and I know that if I keep coming here where it's all at, God will see me and you three together. Thanks. Should I ask the gentleman in the third seat here? Could you? Would you like?
Good night all. My name is Rob and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm very grateful to be uh, at this convention. I'm having a terrific time to be quite honest with you. I think it's uh, marvellous the uh, pain that's gone into it. I come from Melbourne. I'm from a group in Melbourne, the Murrumbina group. Meet Monday night. I was secretary at uh, Melbourne Tuesday night for a fair while and I also took on the Murrumbina but I give Melbourne one away and uh, I think I got a little lot more out of Murrumbina sort of because it had fallen right down. We're trying to build it up again. And uh, we just case along very good now. And uh, I think it's a big thing, this uh, getting involved in AA. It seems to be the secret because uh, I know you don't notice yourself changing, but I know uh, after I was made secretary at uh, Melbourne, or well, uh, uh, women, those people say to me after how I sort of change, you know, get a, a different outlook on life because you're helping more than you're not just. Uh, taking, you're giving too, and that's the main thing. That's what AA is all about, apparently. I don't uh, understand the program fully. It's, uh, I believe in a higher power. I choose to call in God. I know very well he's got me through a lot of tight spots. I started drinking at the age of 15 up in uh, Echuca. It's a country town up in the Murray there. So probably know, and there's uh, 11 pubs in Echuca, I think it was, and the two across the river. Well, uh, I didn't do, uh, I wasn't a dancer. My sister used to go dance, but I preferred to go to the pub. I could still remember, uh, the name of the bloke that I started off drinking with. Tom Buckley. It's, uh, one of those towns where there's, uh, different families. Well, there was the Buckleys and the Martins and, uh, the Victories. Like the Martins and the Cords you hear about in America, I suppose. Well, uh, I remember Tom Buckley, uh, went over to the, uh, the Palace Hotel it was. It was a Richmond pub. It was uh, it's 31 years ago, I think now. And uh, he said uh, I was drinking lemonade. And he said I have a drop of beer in it. Well, uh, which I did. Well, by the end of the day, it had uh, changed. I was just having uh, straight beer. So I couldn't stand the lemonade in it. I remember uh, we lived across the river at that time. My father cleared out on us when we was, I was a little kid, and my mother. Took us up to a cheek where her family lived. And, uh, I remember they were standing out in the front veranda, my sister and mother, and, uh, they took me home in a taxi, and I got out of the taxi, and I thought I'd better show them I'm all right, you know, so I, I ran across, went to vault the, the gate, but, uh, got my foot hooked in the top wire, and down I went. Well, uh, that fast was over, and after that it was, uh, I used to get drunk regularly. I used to get horribly sick from it. I remember my sister, she was a couple of years older than me, and uh, I'd go home and I'd spew my guts out. She'd say, why don't you give it up, Ralph, you can't drink. I'd say, I'll beat it. I kept drinking till I could beat it. But here it's a uh, progressive disease, and uh, it beats you in the end, like uh, the chap that steered me towards Alcoholics Anonymous. I remember he said to me, he was a big rough Irishman. He said to me, you've got to give up, Ralph. He said, you've got to surrender. Surrender to win. I realise now that's what you've got to do because you can't beat this booze. If you keep going, you must go down. I think a higher power steered me. Uh, I got uh, I lost my licence once for six months after my wife had left me. I started off getting around the old traps again. I got it back and uh, I'd sworn off it a bit, but then it wasn't long and I was back in the old routine again. I'd been around the, uh, start off at McNamara's in Caulfield and, uh, he might have left his car because he didn't want to get, he'd got picked up a couple of times before for dunk driving, so, uh, I said, oh, you leave your car and we'll go in mine. I was all right, there's no worries because I was drinking light ale for one thing, so, uh, but that's no different, not if you're, uh, by midnight that night, I think it was, I'd, uh, Left his place and killed. I only had to go straight up the road. I always go, but I got lost somewhere or another. And uh, a couple of ladies in blue got onto me and uh, took me back to Pran, put the breath lies on me, and I was gone again. And this time I lost my life for two years when I went to court. But uh, I think it was a shame and disgrace to getting picked up by a couple of uh, women, I suppose. Might have had something to do with it, but uh, it was my last drink. That was, uh, I remember the date. Uh, 
July the 24th, 1979. I went to my first AA meeting the following Wednesday at St Vincent's. Where I'd been to see a union solicitor on the Tuesday night. We got free legal advice at the union office and uh, it was Peter Redlick and he said to me, he said, is a uh, drink a problem with you, Ralph? I'd showed him a letter from my ex-wife's solicitor. But if I continued to take the children to the hotel, I'd be refused access. Also told him about the second time being picked up for drunk driving. I said, no, it's no problem, Peter. If I can't uh, buy it, I brew my own, which I was. I had a good home brew recipe. I got off a chap at work. By this time I'd made a, quite a few uh, gallons of the stuff. I'd also found out if you put more sugar in the stuff, well, it uh, boosts up the content. You only need a, a few beers of my home brew and you was uh, gone. Because uh, I had to make doing that, because uh, I was married at, uh, and had a couple of children by this time, of course, before my wife left, naturally, and uh, she used to even help me brew it. She'd be cooking up in the kitchen, I'd be boiling the hops up out in the wash house. And had another stove out there. So I'd moved into a house to, uh, uh, I'd be leaving, uh, I didn't believe, I didn't, uh, I was a bit of a workaholic too, to a certain extent, because, uh, I know when I got married, uh, most people send their wives out to work, I didn't believe in that. It was, uh, probably it was ego too, I guess. No, you don't do it, I do it all. So, uh, even though I was on strike, I'd travel all the way to Cranbourne working on farms and that, but uh, it was a bit of a battle and things get you down. But I always, uh, didn't matter how hot it was or that, I always get stuck into the work and I uh, always knew I could have a few beers after work. I look forward to that. In fact, my wife got that way. She uh, knew very well that she'd have to have a bottle, cold bottle for me when I got home from work, otherwise I'd never hit or anything, but uh, she just knew that it fixed me up. I never realised there was anything wrong with my drinking. Because uh, even I went to Sydney one stage for, when I had my 21st in Sydney. I remember my 21st birthday party I had on the side of the railway line in Lidcombe. We got the uh, train driver drunk. They were shunting down below and we got them all full. I don't know whether they got the sack or not, but uh, I know I was horribly sick the next day and uh, nobody had any beer. But somebody had a bottle of uh, sweet sherry. So uh, that sufficed because it was alcohol to me, so I can't say I've never drank clonk because uh, I'm quite sure if, uh, if I was put to the test, I'd have drank metho too, I suppose, because uh, I never did, I don't think. Well, lots of people said my home brew was worse than metho, but uh, that was just their opinion. But I remember the night my wife walked out on me at... Uh, she was going to a party with some friends of hers around the corner. And I stayed home uh, babysitting. Because they weren't my friends. The fun thing, they didn't like my home brew. So uh, they didn't appreciate good beer. So they weren't friends of mine. So uh, I stayed home minding the kids and a bit of an argument started with her girlfriend was there. I had a, a daughter there. We were just taking her off the dummy sort of thing. She was crying. And, uh, Karen put a the dummy in back in Suzanne's mouth and I took it out and she put it back in and I said she doesn't have a dummy and uh, she went and rang me wife up and the third time my wife came home and uh, got the kids and went back to mummy so uh, that was it uh, the divorce went through and she moved down Geelong so that made it uh, very awkward for me but then once again that's something uh, my alcoholic thinking I think because I'd uh, I started going uh, my wife had been baptised at Church of Christ in Oakley and uh, I saw if she went, I was say going down to church myself. I remember one uh used to drive my car down there and a car got pinched one Sunday night from outside the church. Well, my sister came over to take me shopping that Thursday and I was in Oakley and uh, I stuck one of my wife's girlfriends. We're still married at this time. And uh, Pat said, your car get pinched off. I said, yeah, just as well. I said, I've Fix that so-and-so up. She said, what do you mean? I said, I was going up the old man's to get the gun out of blown her bloody head off. And uh, just stupid talk, you know, but uh, next thing I know, that was when my wife took off down to Geelong. So that made it a bit more difficult for me, because I'd had access granted to me by the court for my children, which I had a... John was five and Suzanne was seven at that time. 
They're still living down Geelong. But, uh, I say they started going to Alcoholics Anonymous the second time, and uh, I was around 18 months, I think, and I happened to uh, I broke my ankle at work. I was on compens- the workers' compensation, and uh, I was going to the gallery and a meeting at uh, Flinders Street and a meeting at night. I was going to three meetings a day and uh, for some reason, I don't know why, it was just I'd uh, fill in time, I guess, but uh, I loved the meetings, but by this time I got to like alcohol, it's anonymous. You know, I'd been to uh, three meetings on Tuesday and uh, got home from my meeting at Malvern, or I say my meeting, the meeting where I was secretary, and the phone was ringing at, uh, with my sister and uh, I just had my leg out of the plaster. She said... Uh, you come for I said, oh, yeah, I'm relaxed, I had my feet up, foot up resting it, and uh, she said, I had a, been trying to get on you all day. She said, uh, John's been in the intensive care ward in Geelong Hospital. He got knocked off his bike on his way to school that morning. Well, uh, he was only 10 at the time, and uh, you know, I was tossed straight down to uh, Geelong that night. I didn't have any money, I had no petrol in the car, I still had my car, no lice, but still had my car. So I went and knocked up the old chap next door and uh, got some money off him and uh, tore off down Geelong about two o'clock in the morning. I took a chance on the coppers, but uh, I went down there and I was on compo and I spent three months down there with my son. And uh, all the time it was uh, shocking, you know, he was in a unconscious all that time. I had a a copy of the Serenity Prayer that I'd photosat at work and I put up on the uh, the bed there and that's all that kept me going all that time because it was a shocking period, you know, because he's a, he's a terrific little, he is a terrific little kid, I can't say was, because he is still in that, uh, still in a coma. The doctors say he won't get out of it. I uh, still got my faith in God that he will recover from it, but uh, he can't talk or walk. And uh, for that to happen to a little boy, well, it's uh, perhaps I feel a bit of guilt about it too, because uh, perhaps I was the cause of him tearing down Geelong and uh, all this, you know, but I've just got to accept the fact that uh, it's happened to him. And uh, it's uh, very difficult now because my uh, daughter, she's three years younger than John. I've got a letter, from, I get letters from her regularly and... Uh, I ring them up every week, of course, but uh, I've just got to learn to accept this thing that uh, perhaps my son will stay like it, but uh, also join that Headway group now, because that's a a self-help group for brain-damaged victims, and that's doing me a lot of good. Also, I'm uh, I'm a great believer in this spiritual uh, business, because I do believe in God, and I go to this... um, Pentecostal Church in Richmond Thursday nights now and I pray for my son all the time. I joined a prayer group there and they pray at 10 o'clock every night and, uh, and it does me good. And uh, But I still stick close to Alcoholics Anonymous. I've got to go to meetings every night of the week now if I can. And uh, I think this convention here is incredible and uh, I'm starting, I think I'll start playing towards... Uh, Next year up at Surface Paradises or up Queensland Way anyway and uh, I know we don't project but uh, we can plan, you've got to plan these things. I know I've been looking forward to this weekend for quite a while now and uh, it's turned out even better than I expected. I thank you all very much for sharing and caring. Thanks Dr. Thank Bill from Glen Innes. Night everybody, my name's Bill and I'm an alcoholic. I'm, I'm from the Glen in this group and I know Pilliga Bill put me in for this and I'm going to I'll deal with him later. But uh, I've been, but I didn't mind standing up really because I've, uh, it's no doubt about alcoholics, we do everything backwards. I uh, I think we're supposed to be getting rid of our tails, humans, but I'm, I think I'm growing one. And uh, it gets a bit painful, but I, uh, I've noticed a couple of days I've been here at this convention that there's a lot of people have been grateful about 
being able to stand up sober and, and clean. And it reminds me, I was sitting there and it reminded me of a, I used to get on the grog for weeks on end, you know, I'd, uh, six weeks, I can remember one session lasting six weeks, and mate and I got on it, and I can remember eating baked beans or something once, I think, in that time, but uh, after a certain time on these long sessions, I used to get a, it was, I still don't understand it, but I'd, uh, I'd start to get an idea that I, that I smelt something terrible, you know, and uh, I have no doubt too sometimes, I suppose a bloke was a bit foxy, you know, if when you, I had an aversion to water, uh, both internal and, and external, but uh, this was a terrible thing, I'd, I'd be there and I'd go out every, no, oh, ten minutes some days and I'd have a cold shower, um, then another one, you know, I'd, a bit later on, I always had this this idea. How many I had, I still had this smell about me. It used to embarrass me, something terrible. But uh, when I came to AA, I sort of started to think positive. And I know that nowadays, when I when I think I stink, you know, I really stink. And uh, so that's one good thing it's done to me. But uh, I was brought up in a Catholic school and. Uh, I too was taught that uh, to fear God, and but I'm a bit different. I still fear Him. I know that uh, when I do something wrong, if I'm doing the wrong thing, but when I I'm doing the right thing, like being here tonight, well, He's with me and He's a mate, and uh, and uh, just to see some of the old friends, like Pilliger and the chap here tonight that I've known for many years, as uh, as proof of. Uh, of that, that he's here, and uh, old chap I was sitting with, he's gone now, I can call him an old chap, but uh, I haven't seen him for a long time, and many years ago he and I used to uh, be prospectors on the same creek we were after sapphires, and uh, it was great to sit there with him tonight, I can remember on one occasion, being sapphire miners, of course we were doing quite well, we used to live on one very small tin of baked beans each a day and uh, a loaf of bread when we can get it and we were really doing it hard but I remember one day I had to go up the creek and uh, there was a hut up there where another bloke was and he always doing pretty good but he had a mate in a hotel in Glen Innes and uh, he used to bring him out cold fowls, he was a cook this bloke and uh, always on the grog and he'd bring um, these cold chooks out and uh, uh, so when I went to him he said look could you use a, if I give you four or five of these fowls he said do you think you could eat them he said he's given me too many they're going rotten he said, eh? so I grabbed them of course and and flew up to the old mate and it's a funny thing we'd been in AA both of us for many years when this happened so we, it wasn't grog but it was just that we weren't doing too good but uh, they reckon you shouldn't uh, feed, you know, poultry bones to, to anything that might stick in their neck. But uh, I remember old George, he, he cleaned two of these up without even filleting them, you know. And uh, <laughs> But it's wonderful to be, that's the thing with me. I'm terrible grateful to be uh, here and sober tonight. And I... I Thank God and AA that I am, and uh, thanks very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.